uh, both speakers with four minutes each, inshallah. And at the end, we'll have a 30 minutes question and answer session. And papers and uh, papers and pens will be given out near the end for anyone who has any written questions. And we hope to finish at 5:30 today. And um, to introduce our speakers and those who have been here for the last few days, obviously we would not need an introduction anymore. But for those who are here for the first time, our first speaker, as I mentioned, is um, Brother Shabir Ali on my left. Brother Shabir Ali hails. Uh, sorry, hails from the other side of the Atlantic, um, where he lives with his wife and four children. He is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawa Centre International based in Toronto, Canada. He has a BA in Religious Studies at Lauriston University in Canada and he is currently completing his master's degree with the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Mr. Shabir Ali has served for many years as an Imam and a public speaker for Islam and has, appear, has appeared regularly or as a guest on a weekly television broadcast in Canada called Let the Quran Speak. He has represented Islam in many interfaith dialogues and debates. In this very hall, he has, he has fruitful dialogues with the likes of Dr. Joe, Dr. Joe Marcus and others. Elsewhere, he has doc, d debated Dr. John Warwick Montgomery and the world, an international, uh, a scholar of international repute, Dr. William Lane Craig. Also, Brother Shabir Ali considers himself a student of the experienced masters who, has trodden, who have trodden the path of interfaith dialogue and debates such as Sheikh Ahmadida, Rahimullah, and the likes of Dr. Jamal al-Badawi. And our second honorable guest is Dr. Uh, Dr. Anish Shirosh, who is Palestinian-born Christian and a native of Nazareth. He has graduated from Clark and Mississippi Colleges and has earned a Master in Theology, a Doctor in Ministry and a Doctor in Philosophy and is a member of the Oxford Society of Scholars. In 2004, he was awarded with the Silver Quill Award from Oxford Graduate School of Dayton in the Tennessee, the US. Dr. Shosh is a former pastor in Palestine, in Jerusalem, sorry, and served as an evangelist in the Middle East from 1959 to 1966. And he has been an international evangelical and evangelist for the last past 38 years and has preached in some 76 countries. He is a renowned debater with Muslims and has debated Sheikh Ahmadida, Rahimallah, and the world's leading Islamic apologist before thousands of Muslims and Christians in Canada and Birmingham, and has also debated the well known Muslim scholar Dr. Jamal Badawi in the US. Shorosh also has lectured on Islam, Middle East, and prophecy, and is a producer of documentaries. To date, he has authored 10 books, with the latest being Islam, a Threat or a Challenge and has translated the document, the, the True Furqan, from Arabic into English. Shirosh is the founder and president of the Anish Shirosh Evangelistic Association, which serves as an outreach for both Muslims and Christians worldwide. He and his wife now have pa are parents of four children and eight grandchildren. Inshallah. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest, but just one point. Other point is... Um, also, the, uh, the conduct in the mosque itself, uh, in the church, should I say? <laughs> that was the wrong building. In the church, um, again, while the speakers are speaking, obviously, all respect has got to give to both speakers, Dr. Shosh and Dr. Ari. No clapping or cheering or any other comments during, during, the talk, during their um, presentations. Also, um, please switch off your mobile phones. No photographs will be taken after the first five minutes of the main presentation. No videotaping, as we mentioned, um, is getting done professionally. Um, stewards are at the side if anybody has any problems or any situations, and please just um, uh, ask one of the stewards for any help that's any needed. And again, I'd stress on the point that please do respect our guests. Question and answers, as I said, paper and pen will begin at the end for those who would like to ask any questions to our guests. Um, in case of a fire hazard, the, the exits are two at the back and one on my left here. Uh, sorry. On the right, not the left one, the right one. And um, inshallah, toilets are for the brothers downstairs, for the gentlemen downstairs, and the sisters and the ladies upstairs. Um, and also, another uh, issue was brought up to me yesterday as well, and today again, was the cleansiness of the church. Um, please do not leave empty bottles or crisp packets or anything behind. Firstly, you shouldn't be bringing them into the actual the, 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 the main hall. The only thing you're allowed is bottled water. 
um, because we've had a few incidents with the likes of Iron Brew and Coke. As you know, when you spill it, it leaves a great stain. Um, so please do not bring any fizzy soft drinks into the hall. Water is allowed. And, and please, as I said, if you do bring anything with you, make sure you take it away as well and leave the place as we, as we entered it. Sorry, a sanctuary, I beg your pardon. So in this sanctuary, respect is due, so therefore please leave with anything you bring in and make sure you leave with it. Jazakallah khair. So again, our first speaker is Dr. Um, our brother Shabir Ali. And today's topic, as I mentioned, is crucifixion or crucifixion. I greet you all again with the greeting of peace. Peace be upon you and the mercy and blessings of God. I praise uh, the creator and the fashioner of the heavens and the earth and I ask him to bless uh, all of us tonight with his guidance and mercy and I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers. Now, uh, very quickly before I get into the heart of today's topic, I just want to follow up on a small matter from last night. Dr. Shirosh was concerned that I'm not uh, honestly reading a certain passage from the book of Exodus, and I want to clarify that situation. What I referred to was the book of Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I f at first said it was chapter 8, and Dr. Shirosh rightly corrected me it was chapter 7. But the important thing there is that in verse number 30, as Stephen is referring back to the situation of the burning bush, and what Stephen says that it was that it was an angel who appeared as the flame. Now when Stephen says an angel, uh, then naturally he's not referring to God, because God is not an one of something. God is not one of a category. God is in a category all by himself. So it is quite clear from Stephen's speech that the flame was not God, but uh, the representation of an angel. Dr. Shiroz drew my attention to Exodus chapter 3, where obviously God speaks to Moses from the flame. But my very point there is that uh, the, though the voice obviously speaking to Moses is representing itself as a message coming from God, one should not think of God being in the flame, because otherwise Stephen's statement would be wrong. And uh, I do not believe that Dr. Shirosh will admit to Stephen's statement being wrong, because Stephen, according to that passage, was filled with the Holy Spirit when he said these things. So we have it then that if the New Testament is allowed to interpret the Old, then it is clear that it was an angel and not God. Now, Dr. Shirosh's uh, uh, difficulty here is compounded because he relied on English translations that said the angel of the Lord in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, but uh, my translation, the New American Bible, which I read last night, it makes it clear by sh showing that it, it reads an angel of the Lord. And that corresponds then with what we already found from Stephen's speech. It was an angel, not the angel of the Lord. That might be somehow confused uh, with divinity himself. So then, I think that point lays to rest. If Dr. Shirosh has any further clarifications on that, I'd be glad to hear it. Otherwise, uh, we can leave that aside and I move on now to our main subject matter. Now, how do we use uh, the materials to establish whether or not Jesus uh, died on the cross and rose again from the dead? For a Muslim, the Quran is the final word. It is the word of God, and the Muslim would turn to the Quran. Likewise, for the Christian, the Bible is the word of God, and the Christian turns there. Muslims and Christians have had two different views on this matter uh, for centuries, and they may continue to hold different views on the matter. But tonight, I hope that our discussion will help us to clarify the views a little bit more and uh, may lead some people to uh, sh shift their opinions. I think the evidence I have to present tonight is very strong, and uh, we will see where that leads. Now first, because I'm a Muslim, naturally I would begin by presenting what the Quran has to say on this matter. However, the Quran's uh, statement about the crucifixion and ascension of Jesus are very brief and elusive. Elusive is a term which means then that it does not simply describe the whole episode, but it alludes to the story which is already there and known uh, to the contemporaries, the hearers of the Quran when it was first uh, addressed. It is important then in uh, understanding the Quran that uh, we uh, understand what was known about the crucifixion and ascension of Jesus prior to the Quran's revelation. And uh, this, of course, is how the Muslim scholars uh, interpreting the Quran proceeded. They sought information from their Jewish and Christian friends and used that information to elaborate 
uh, on the brief statements of the Quran. So it would be proper procedure then for me to, before introducing the Quranic text here, to look at what sorts of information was available prior to the Quranic revelation. And I begin naturally with the Gospels, which uh, are the most prime, uh, uh, are the prime sources for information about the life and teachings of Jesus. Now you will recall from my presentation last night that prior to the Gospels, Paul's writings were already available. And so I'll be making references to Paul's uh, letters as well. Now, a question arose as to whether or not I'm using scholarship that is representative, uh, representative of the field. Am I just using modern liberal scholarship, people who do not believe in God and, and just appealing to their uh, points of view regarding the treatment of the Gospels? I should clarify then that when we refer to scholars, we should refer to mainstream scholarship, but uh, just the reference to a scholar is not the thing that settles the case. What settles the case is the proof and evidence which various scholars have given for their positions. I am convinced that the proof and evidence that is offered by scholarship that uh, holds the positions which I have uh, expressed last night uh, are really strong uh, proofs and, and bits of evidence. and. Uh, it is that which actually holds uh, uh, its own ground, regardless of who agrees with it or who does not agree with it. In other words, it does not matter whether scholars said so or didn't say so. The fact of the matter is that you have to have proof for your position. But citing scholars is a quick way of, of showing that the matter has been discussed, it has been known, it has been written about, and Christian biblical scholars have said the same thing. And if they have said that, it gives great weight to a Muslim argument to be able to cite these Christian scholars. Now, over the, my history of uh, debating and discussing with others, I have found that often when I quote uh, a certain scholar representing an opinion which uh, my opponent does not want to hear, the opponent uh, sidelines the scholar, says, I don't want to believe in that scholar. Uh, and it so happened on one occasion that I first asked the person I'm going to have a dialogue with uh, to name me his scholars, and he did, including William Barclay. And when I sat before him and started presenting what William Barclay had said in his daily Bible commentary, one point after another, eventually he said to me, you know what, I have to rethink my position about William Barclay. <laughs> Good one. So we cannot have shifting ground like this. Now, it was in, it suggested last night that, in fact, uh, we should uh, look at what conservative Christian scholars have had to say about the issues. Now, remember what the issues were. The most important issue that I emphasized last night was what we call the priority of Mark. The idea is Mark's gospel is written, uh, or was written, before the other three. And that Matthew and Luke, therefore, used Mark as a source for composing their own gospels. Now, this is an essential point that will lead into what we need to discuss tonight, our way of examining the Gospels and finding out whether or not Jesus really was crucified and whether he really did uh, rise from the dead. Now, Muslims and Christians both believe that he ascended to God, and so that matter is not in dispute. But what about our, our other questions then? Now, F.F. F. Bruce uh, is undisputedly a conservative scholar uh, of the Christian faith, and so too is Bruce Metzger. Let me give you some of their citations, just to give you an idea of where these uh, scholars are heading with this. Now, if I begin with F.F. F. Bruce, for example, in his uh, article entitled uh, The Fourfold, uh, Fourfold Gospel, which uh, appears in the Bible Commentary, uh, this is what he has to say. All four of our canonical gospels are probably to be dated within the four decades, AD 60 to 100. And you will recall that those are the dates that I gave, that I said that Mark was written approximately 66 to 70, and John, the last of the Gospels, around the year 100. F.F. Uh, Bruce is giving the same time frame, between 60 to 100. Now, he tells us that John stands apart from the other Gospels and is best considered independently. You will recall that I said that John is the different Gospel, the other three are called the synoptics, and this is exactly the term that F.F. F. Bruce uses. As for the synoptic Gospels, he tells us that the substance of 606 out of the 661 verses of Mark's Gospel reappears in, addition, in a, a, a bridge form in, Ma, in Matthew. In other words, he's saying that Mark has 661 verses all, of the, all together. Out of the 661 verses, 600 of them appear in an abridged form 
in Matthew's Gospel. So you can see where the degree of influence lies. Now, out of the 661 verses of Mark, 380 of them appear also in the Gospel according to Luke. So you can see that according to this scholar, Matthew has taken 600 verses from Mark, and Luke has taken 380 verses from Mark. Now, there are 31 verses of Mark which does not appear in any of the other Gospels. And in fact, when we consider carefully what are those 31 uh, verses, you will see that invariably they say something that's not palatable to the others. And this is why eventually they got to be omitted. We said last night that in fact uh, Mark's gospel represents Jesus in ways that did not quite gel with the later elaborations of him. That as time passed, it was more important to represent uh, Jesus uh, in a more developed form. And in fact, if we turn now to Bruce Metzger, in his book uh, on the New Testament, its background, growth, and content, he gives us several examples of how Matthew and Luke have improved upon the story the way it was first told in Mark. So it's told in Mark one way. Matthew and Luke have before them a copy of Mark, and they're copying as they go. But they also make important changes. And today we can study them together. We can look at them synoptically, and we can see not only where they are together on the story, but we can see where they diverge and why they diverge. And we can see how Matthew and Luke have improved the image of Jesus over time. And that leads me then to um, our topic for tonight. How do we evaluate these Gospels and understand the crucifixion? First of all, uh, was Jesus killed on a cross? Now, all of the four Gospels have it that Jesus uh, was put on the cross, that he eventually expired, he was taken down dead, uh, and he was put in a tomb. It wasn't the sort of uh, burial that Muslims are generally accustomed to, so I have to explain this point. Uh, usually a Muslim is buried underground, and six feet of soil is piled on top of him. In this case, we are reading about a man who was uh, placed, or whose uh, remains, whose dead body was placed uh, in some sort of an open uh, chamber, a cave, and that a rock was uh, rolled against the mouth of that cave, and he was left for dead. And then the story continues that, in fact, uh, a couple of days uh, later, as his female disciples came to the tomb, they found that uh, the stone uh, was opened and uh, the body was not there. Eventually they began to see uh, appearances of Jesus and uh, they concluded naturally that Jesus has now come back to life. And so the Christian faith is born. That then is the basic outline of the story. But now, if we are to look at the details of the story, there is more to be understood. We said previously that Paul uh, is the first writer of the New Testament materials. In his letters were, in fact, uh, written before any of the four Gospels. And it is in his letter to the Corinthians that Paul uh, stressed that Jesus was raised back to life. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 and in chapter 15, Paul goes on to stress these uh, uh, teachings. But for Paul, Jesus did not resurrect back to life in a physical form. If his re writing is read carefully, what Paul is saying is that Jesus was sown as a physical body, just like a seed is sown, dead, but then he sprung back to life in a spiritual form. Because the flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God, it is the spirit that does for Paul. So Paul preached that Jesus, though appearing to be dead to everyone else, um, is alive with God. He is spiritually now resurrected. Paul does not say that the tomb of Jesus was empty. And Paul does not need to say that the tomb of Jesus was empty because Paul is not speaking of a physical resurrection. But once the idea of the resurrection uh, comes to be known, naturally, the Gospels written after that would try to fill out that bit and try to say that if Jesus is resurrected from the dead, well, naturally, his tomb is also empty. You can understand what would happen once such a preaching goes on. Somebody says, Jesus is alive. And somebody asks, well, how do you know that? Well, he's alive. He resurrected from the dead. But how do you know that? Well, he's alive. Well, isn't he rotting in his tomb? Well, no. He's alive. But how do you know he's not rotting in his tomb? Well, because the female disciples went and checked the tomb. 
and they found that his body is not there. You can understand how the story would evolve over time. And in fact, uh, when we look at the gospel side by side, uh, we will see how in fact the story has evolved even among the gospels. Let's take it a step at a time. Let's talk first about the crucifixion before we get to the idea of the resurrection. So we read then that uh, Jesus is arrested and he is given some punishments. But Pilate wants Jesus to go, wants Jesus to go free. Pilate eventually reluctantly sentences Jesus to death. And this is public knowledge. It is said that Pilate came forward three times and appealed to the crowd to let Jesus go free. He said, I found no guilt in this man. He is innocent. Eventually they pressed him, it is said. And with this arm twisting, eventually Pilate agreed to let him be killed. But then he symbolically came forward and washed his hands, saying, I'm washing my hands of the blood of this man. So it is obvious that Pilate does not want to kill Jesus and naturally Pilate's uh, subordinates would carry out Pilate's wish. If they have to kill Jesus because they have to kill Jesus, they will do it na naturally in the most mild mannered manner as possible. Nothing like you've seen in the Passion of the Christ. If you want a more realistic depiction of the kinds of punishments that Jesus might have received prior to his crucifixion, and of the crucifixion itself, then uh, look at another film, one by John Heyman, Jesus of Nazareth, which has been distributed widely uh, by uh, Campus Crusaders for Christ in the United States and in Canada. A more realistic depiction. Not the kinds of tortures that he endures in the Passion of the Christ, where he must have died nine times before he even reached the cross. And you even die from watching it, as uh, did happen in the case of one unfortunate woman. So then, you see, even the story continues to evolve even after the Gospels are written, because something like The Passion of the Christ is an artistic uh, production uh, trying to tell you how the story should be viewed. And in fact, uh, even though the Gospel materials are available in written form and people know what the Gospels say, and even though the film misrepresents the Gospel material, people are still coming out of the movie theaters and saying, it's all true, it's, it's, it's in the Gospels. But it's not in the Gospels the way it is depicted in that film. Now what is in the Gospels is that Pilate then reluctantly orders for Jesus to be killed or hands him over for them to kill him. That's more precisely what the Gospels are telling us. And now they put him on a cross. It was morning that Friday when they put him on a cross and then by evening something has to be done. Because the Jews have a rule that a crucified victim would defile the land and he should be taken down by nightfall. But this particular nightfall was special because the Sabbath is uh, beginning uh, to appear on that Friday evening. So the Jews have to go indoors to observe their Sabbath. They have to leave the scene. And they want also for the body to be taken down because this crucified body, according to their, uh, their, their Torah, the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 21, verse number 23, the body that is hanged is accursed. So they said, we do not want this curse to be there defiling the land. They want him taken down. Now crucifixion, you should recall, does not kill a person instantly. It may take many days for the person to finally expire. Josephus, the Roman historian, uh, or the, rather the Jewish uh, historian, uh, writes that on one occasion he was uh, flabbergasted when he arrived in the city to find out that three of his friends were being crucified. He used his influence to have them taken down from the cross and given medical treatment. Two of them died anyway, but one of them survived. The important point here is that it might take a while for the crucified victim to die. Usually uh, there was no piercing of any part of the body. If there was a piercing, there was probably a piercing of the nails in the, in the wrist joint and probably also in the feet. Now the crucified body could also be tied to the cross. And since tying was a lesser form of torture than nailing, and since uh, Pilate was uh, favorable towards Jesus and only reluctantly carrying out the wish of the opponents, we can imagine then that uh, Jesus probably was tied and not nailed. In any case, the nailing in the wrists uh, would not uh, be 
uh, the reason for his death. Reason for the death of the crucified victim is uh, usually exhaustion uh, and, uh, and the dehydration and shock eventually resulting from that. And that took a couple of days. But then, if you wanted the body taken down dead so that you can go away to observe your Sabbath, there was a way out. You can break the legs of the victim. What would that do? Well, two things. First, simply, if you break his legs and you take him down in a, in a day and age 2,000 years ago when you did not have the kind of palliative, palliative care that we have now, you take a person down with broken legs, even if he is alive, he couldn't get very far. You may as well consider him dead. He's disposed of, he's done with. So you break his legs. But more importantly, the crucified victim survives as long as he could breathe. And to breathe, he has to keep his body upright. When his body sags, his diaphragm expands with the inhaled air, and he has no way of uh, expelling that inhaled air. If he has no knees, his body remains sagged, and he suffocates on his own carbon dioxide. He dies quickly. So the Jews, uh, according to the Synoptic Gospels at least, well, all of the Gospels in fact, uh, the Jews petitioned Pilate, the Roman governor, to have Jesus' legs broken so that he could be taken down from the cross. So that the Sabbath would not be defiled. And they obviously go away to observe the Sabbath. Now, according to Mark's Gospel, when this request was put to Pilate, Pilate was amazed that Jesus could have died so soon. But when he received assurance from the centurion that Jesus had died, that's when he granted release of the body. Now, reading this, you may wonder, why was Pilate amazed? It's for the very reason that we have just explained. That it usually took a few days for the crucified victim to die. And in this case, this crucified victim had died very quickly. Did he really die? Pilate wanted to know. And a reader reading Mark's Gospel may be asking the same question. Did Jesus really die? Matthew and Luke, having Mark's Gospel before them, have simply omitted the mention that Pilate was amazed. So that if people were asking that question after reading Mark's Gospel, they wouldn't be able to ask the same question after reading Matthew and Luke. Remember that these Gospels were written in different areas and circulated to different readers. The readers of one uh, were not privy to the information from another. So readers of Matthew and Luke's Gospel could be quite satisfied that Jesus had really died. You see the improvement in the story as we go. Now Jesus is taken down, it is said, and he is placed in the tomb. So now, folks, to pick up uh, where we left off, you we were asking, were, uh, were, were the legs of Jesus broken? We said that when Pilate gave the instruction to go break their legs and have Jesus taken down from the cross, the soldiers came and uh, they broke the legs of the one crucified victim and apparently bypassed Jesus, broke the legs of the other thief, and then finally came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. Now what does it mean that they found that he was already dead? Today, in order to know that someone is dead, we might uh, check his pulse. Did anyone check his pulse? His hands were on the cross. Uh, did anyone listen to his breathing with a stethoscope? Obviously there was no such thing available. By the primitive methods, they thought that Jesus was dead, and so they took him down and put him in that uh, burial chamber. But now, looking back at, over the records, we have no guarantee that Jesus actually died. And this is my first point, my first major point in tonight's presentation, that uh, it will be impossible now to prove that Jesus actually died, and it looks like he did not actually die on the cross itself. Now, uh, John's Gospel coming later seems to have solved the problem, because if we are wondering what killed Jesus, uh, John introduces uh, an instrument of death. He has uh, the a Roman soldier poke Jesus in the side with a spear and tells us that immediately gushed forth uh, blood and water. So one reading that today can think, well, certainly he must have died from that spear wound. But uh, John has written this for apologetic purposes, for this very purpose that we described earlier. As the story is being discussed later on, and people look at this and say, well, wait a minute, his legs were not broken, so uh, what killed him? How did he die? Did anyone really make sure that he was dead? 
So John's gospel written the last of the four is making sure that there is something that proves that Jesus was dead. Unfortunately, however, John in writing this did not quite uh, finish uh, the matter uh, as he might have expected because as Raymond Brown points out, the term that he used for the poking with the spear is a, kind of, uh, is a word that indicates a kind of a prod that you might give to someone to find out if he's sleeping. And the same word is used in Acts of the Apostles in reference to Peter uh, when the angel came to Peter and prodded him to wake him up in his uh, jail cell. So then, uh, finally, we have it that there is no assurance that Jesus actually died on the cross. Naturally, if you took him down and buried him under six feet of dirt, he would uh, definitely die. But then if you put him in an, open chair, uh, uh, in an open chamber where he can still breathe oxygen, it is possible that if he was in a comatose stage that he might actually recover. Now, the Gospels tell us that in fact uh, later on, the disciples of Jesus, the female ones to begin with, came to see the tomb and they found that uh, Jesus' body was not there. Now, why would they come to see the tomb? Now this is a puzzle for some people, but uh, the explanation I will provide uh, very quickly now. Some of the Gospels have it that the female disciples of Jesus went and brought spices to come and anoint the body of Jesus. But the Gospel according to John tells us that Jesus' body was already anointed for proper burial, wrapped in a hundred pounds of aloes and spices on the night of his burial, meaning on the Friday night. So Sunday morning, the female disciples of Jesus would have no reason to come and anoint him with spices. In any case, uh, in a Jewish culture, women would not be anointing the body of a dead male with uh, spices. And if, if such an anointment was to be done, it uh, wouldn't be done uh, a few days after uh, the, the death. So what then was the reason for them to come to the tomb? Matthew's gospel tells us that they came to see the tomb. Now Matthew is the most Jewish of the four Gospels and probably Matthew understood what the Jewish custom was. This Jewish custom is uh, explained in the Talmud as quoted by uh, John Rousseau and Rami Arav in their book uh, The a Cultural and Archaeological Dictionary, Jesus and His uh, World. What they explain from the Talmud is that uh, three days after burial you should go and, and have a look at the tomb because it is possible that the person is still alive. And uh, the Talmud uh, relates that in the past it did occur that a certain individual was presumed dead, he was buried and he was found later on alive and he continued to live on and have uh, uh, children. So uh, the custom then uh, continued that one should go and examine the tomb to see if that person was still alive. Now today we hardly have any reason to, to examine the tomb to see if perhaps the person is alive and that's because of the way in which uh, we have evolved our manner in dealing with, uh, with death and burial. First of all we have the electrocardiogram. We do a test to make sure the heart is uh, completely dead and we do an, uh, uh, an ECG test as well. Uh, we do an ECG which is the, uh, for the heart and EEG for the brain. Uh, to make sure that the brain is completely dead and that's when the person gets finally buried but not before he's put in the morgue and watch for a while if he's to come back to life we will see it and if not then finally the poor chap is uh, buried but uh, 2000 years ago when these methods were not available a person might be presumed dead and prematurely buried now when we understand this, in fact, many Muslims would reflect and understand better a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which uh, directs you to treat the body uh, in, a, in a reasonable manner so that you do not cause any undue pain because it's possible the person could feel pain, which means that the person may be in a some, some sort of uh, state which does not allow him to communicate. He might appear dead, but that person may actually be still alive. And uh, a couple of hundred years ago, you had no better uh, recourse but to bury the person when he appeared to be dead. You did not have life support mechanisms to keep such a person uh, in, in the world uh, of the living. You had to send him off to the land of the dead. And so, we have then no firm evidence that Jesus actually died. So now, when reports say that he came back to life, it might actually be his uh, recovery from such a comatose stage and we have then uh, to emphasize my point already made uh, no firm evidence that Jesus actually died on the cross itself what about his reappearance from the dead 
Now here is where we see the Gospels uh, improving the material over time. So the female disciples uh, go to visit the tomb and there they meet a young man according to Mark's Gospel. This young man becomes an angel in Matthew's Gospel and becomes two angels in Luke's Gospel. You can see the evolution of the story over time. In Mark's Gospel, when they come there, they find that the tomb was already opened. So now a question might arise. Who opened the tomb? Where did that body go? Who took the body? But Matthew solves that problem by having the tomb open in their presence. So one reading Matthew's Gospel should not ask this question because Matthew's Gospel says that an angel of the Lord came down, an angel, uh, came down and, sat, and rolled that stone away and, and sat upon it. So there the women can have no doubt that prior to the rolling of the, of the stone, nobody had meddled with this tomb and it is fine, Jesus' body was uh, there where it was left, but God miraculously took him, raised him back to life. Matthew has solved the problem by improving the story. And then we read about Jesus appearing to his disciples uh, time and again. But as we read these stories again, we see the evolution of the stories and we see the contradictions between them. First of all, uh, notice the contradictions so you can see with me the need to, to understand how the story evolved over time. According to the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus appeared to his disciples uh, on that evening of Sunday, what is called the Easter Sunday, there were 11 of them. But according to John's Gospel, when Jesus appeared to them that evening, there were only 10. Because Thomas was absent. Jesus would come back a week later and appear to Thomas in their presence. Now what John has done there is John has removed Thomas for his own reasons. And the contradiction shows that he has done this. Because by Luke saying that Jesus appeared to the eleven, that means there were eleven men. But by John removing Thomas, John can make the point that Thomas was the one doubting. And Jesus came and appeared to him and settled the issue and removed his doubt. So nobody should have any doubt anymore. Otherwise you'll be like the doubting Thomas and Thomas was already fixed. What about you? So John then has remodeled the story in order to make this particular emphasis. And we see from one incident after another that this is how the materials have been treated. The number of appearances uh, could come to be multiplied. Uh, as we go from one gospel to another. And uh, the degree of clarity to which uh, Jesus is now recognized also becomes enhanced as we go from one gospel to another over time. I should clarify here that somebody already made an enhancement to Mark's gospel as well to bring it in line with the others. What someone has done is someone has got to Luke's Gospel, Matthew's Gospel, John's Gospel, gathered details from all of those and brought them into 12 verses and made them Mark chapter 16 verses 9 to 20. But the earliest manuscripts we have of Mark's Gospel ends with verse number 8 in that chapter. Verses 9 to 20 is, are marked off in the New International Version uh, Bible as uh, not being available in the oldest and earliest manuscripts of the Bible, which uh, shows that they are in fact a later edition, and this has been admitted by Bruce Metzger and many other conservative biblical scholars, especially those who are experts in the field of textual criticism. So then, what do we have finally? We have finally that, as well that there is no assurance that Jesus really reappeared to his disciples after he had been taken down from the cross and presumed dead. An important point in this regard is that when the narratives tell us that Jesus reappeared to his disciples, invariably they show that Jesus is not immediately recognized from his face and his voice. Now naturally what we would want is some eyewitness to come forward and say, look, we saw Jesus, we know him, we always knew him, and we easily recognized him, and we know that's the man. We identified him. He, he, saw, he came and appeared to us, we know him. But look what we read about instead. Recall that Mary was there in the garden, his disciple Mary Magdalene, and Jesus uh, comes up to her and addresses her. And she turns around and looks at him, and she says, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell us where you have laid him so that I can take him away. She doesn't recognize that this is Jesus himself. 
She mistook him for the gardener. Now why didn't she recognize him from his face? Well, it, it, she turned to look at him. <laughs> that is the point, Dr. Shiro. She turned to look at him. And still she took, mistook him for the gardener. Uh, all right, I'll let you come back and then you can deal with the points. But uh, uh, when, you, when you read the Gospels, you will see that she turned to look at him and yet she mistook him for the gardener. Moreover, why didn't she recognize him from his voice? Gentlemen, I have to tell you a secret that when you lie, your wives will recognize the change in your voice. Women are very good with voices. <laughs> so then, why didn't she recognize that this was Jesus speaking to her? Obviously, what they saw and heard was someone who didn't look like Jesus and didn't sound like Jesus. But this someone apparently had certain appearances of having been once crucified. He had marks to show. So when he appears to the disciples, according to the Gospel of Luke, he shows them his hands and feet. And when he appears to Thomas, he says, Come, put your finger in, in the nail wound. Here, put your hand in the side. So now if you have to recognize him by these bits of circumstantial evidence, you can easily have here a person who had once been hung on a cross but taken down alive, but one who does not look like Jesus and doesn't sound like Jesus. In other words, your eyewitness testimony here does not actually meet the criterion of satisfying and removing any doubts. They might have seen someone else. The Gospel according to John in chapter 21 has an interesting statement. It says that the disciples were there on the shore and uh, Jesus, uh, well, Jesus was on the shore, the disciples were fishing. Eventually they came up on the shore as well to meet Jesus and he was there cooking them a breakfast. And they sat and they ate. But no one dared to ask him who he was because they were sure it was the Lord. What does it mean no one dared to ask him who he was because they were sure it was the Lord? It means that later on, after all is said and done, they're still wondering, was that the Lord or was he not? And they're discussing it. Why didn't you ask him? Well, we were sure, but were you really sure? So it turns out that finally, we do not have any clear evidence that uh, Jesus actually reappeared alive to his disciples after he was once presumed dead. That's my second point. Third point is that it is the obligation of the Christian apologist to actually prove first that Jesus died and second that he rose again and reappeared alive to his disciples in a bodily form. Why is there an obligation? Usually a believer does not have an obligation to prove his faith. I say I believe in God, I don't have to prove that to somebody who does not believe. I can say, to me, my religion, to you, yours. I don't have to prove anything to you. But the Christian apologist has an obligation to prove the death and resurrection of Jesus because of what Paul has already written. In his letter to the Galatians, in chapter 3, verse number 13, Paul wrote that Jesus died as a curse for us. He accepts that Jesus fulfills the requirement of an accursed person. Referring to Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse number 23. So now, if Jesus died the death of an accursed person, why would God raise him back to life? You have to have clear and firm evidence that he actually was raised back to life. And in fact, Christian apologists, all the way from uh, Dr. William Lane Craig to Josh McDowell uh, to my friend Jay Smith in this country, whom I debated with before, have accepted that it is necessary for them to prove this. Jay Smith, in his article on the resurrection posted on his website, in fact, goes into <coughs> detail about this. And said that the very belief that Jesus is the Son of God is dependent on his resurrection. And the belief that the Bible is the Word of God is dependent on the resurrection. So you have to prove the resurrection first in order to prove that Jesus is the Son of God and in order to prove that the Bible is the Word of God. So you cannot turn it the other way around and say, well, the Bible is the Word of God. It says that Jesus resurrected from the dead and therefore he did. According to these apologists, you have to start by first proving by using historical means that Jesus actually resurrected from the dead and then you will know that he is the son of God and then you will know that the rest of the Bible that deals with him is true. So my third point now 
uh, introduces the way forward for Dr. Sharosh. This is his obligation to come and prove this. Finally, what about Jesus dying for the sins of human beings? If Jesus did not die, then how can our sins be paid for? The simple answer for that is that uh, our sins do not have to be paid for by somebody dying for our sins. Our sins can be forgiven by the merciful God if we simply pray to him and ask him for our forgiveness. And when I come back, I will have a chance to elaborate more on this particular point. And my last uh, point tonight is uh, about the Quranic text. Many have understood the Quran as uh, implying that someone else was crucified instead of Jesus. But I think a better reading of the Quran is one already su suggested by um, the Alama Zamakshari in his book Al-Kashaf, a commentary on, on the, the Quran. And though he made this as a suggestion, he did not finally follow through with it, but I think the suggestion is a good one. And it's taken up by Muhammad Asad in his translation and commentary entitled The Message of the Quran. And this is a view that in fact is uh, widely held by Muslim writers today. For example, Tarif Khalidi in his book, The Muslim Jesus, and Rukhaya Waris Maksud in her book, The Mysteries of uh, Jesus. What they say basically is that even though Jesus was put on the cross, he did not actually die on the cross. And the Quran's main point is that they did not actually succeed in crucifying Jesus, meaning that even though they put him on the cross, the very objective of putting him there to kill him on the cross was not successful. We can then hold as Muslims that uh, God rescued Jesus and raised him to himself in some mysterious, perhaps spiritual way, perhaps physical, in a way that we are unable to describe, but in no way that defies any of the historical information that is known, either that is uh, firmly established from the Gospels themselves or from any other historical uh, sources. In short then, if the Quran is read, read properly, we will understand that uh, there is nothing in the Quran that defies uh, history. And at the same time, the Quran seems to be hinting back at something that is already known from the Gospels. That in the first place, there was some doubt that Jesus really died on the cross. And that doubt was based on, real, uh, on the real knowledge of how crucified victims might be dealt with. I just have a few seconds remaining. And I'll wrap up very quickly. Uh, I'm told one minute. Uh, very quickly then, the Jews had requested for the knees to be broken and the bodies to be taken down. But then the knees were not broken. Then according to Matthew's gospel, on the day of the Sabbath themselves, they found it so uh, important that they rushed into Pilate's court to complain and to ask for the tomb to be sealed up. Why? Because they said the disciples will come steal him away and then tell everyone that he raised uh, back to, to life. And then the second deception will be greater than the first. What was the first? They felt themselves deceived because the legs were not broken and they thought that apparently Jesus is taken down alive. It seems that the Quran is referring to the same thing when it says that they differed concerning him. They have no firm knowledge. Apparently, Jesus had not died. Thank you very much. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, um, Dr. Shirosh, to come forward. Thank you. Sorry. Just one second. While they're getting the tape ready, let me thank each one of you for taking time to be with us, and I appreciate the joy and privilege of sharing with you the truth. The battle for truth, not just the battle for books. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I'm so glad that my opponent has admitted to you publicly what no Muslim has ever believed, that the crucifixion never took place. He believes it did. And he's trying to interpret it that it did not mean death. Well, I've got news for you this afternoon, and I'm delighted you're here, and we're ready to proceed with utmost speed. Thank you, sir. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, prophecy, and that he was buried 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas that's Peter then by the twelve after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep meaning they died first Corinthians 15 1 to 6 it is necessary to elucidate the connection between the above statement and the person who was inspired to write it the Apostle Paul explains the impact of the truth of the death and resurrection of Christ on his life the following is his report in Galatians 1 11 to 13 but I make known to you brethren that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it I hope he will become another Paul by discovering this truth the details of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ prophetically historically and by eyewitnesses are unassailable furthermore the Gospels themselves dedicate practically a fourth of their contents to the description and explanation of the crucifixion and resurrection of Messiah Jesus God the Son throughout the world the symbol of the Christian faith has been the cross it is accepted as a reminder of their crucifixion by over two billion people at the dawn of history some of you are wearing it on your neck or on your wrist tombs of saints and prophets exist in many nations but in Jerusalem the tomb of Jesus is empty Muslims affirm that Jesus is alive in heaven and is coming back someday why not Muhammad even during Christ's lifetime there were those who objected to the idea that the Messiah would be crucified as found in John 12:34, the leading disciple of Jesus was one of those when Jesus announced that he would be arrested killed and raised the third day we hear Peter's refusal of believing such a thing far be it from you Lord this shall not happen to you Matthew 16 22 the record of the Old Testament now let's examine what the prophetic scripture stated many centuries before Christ Genesis 3 15 and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel here at the dawn of man's history is a promise of the Almighty God concerning the Savior these words are spoken to Satan the serpent after he tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God for centuries the church has understood this text to point to the seed of the woman Jesus the Christ according to Galatians 4 4 Psalms 22 in the Psalms of David the following was predicted a thousand years before the event took place on Mount Calvary in Jerusalem my God my God why have you forsaken me why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning but I'm a worm and no man a approach of men and despise of the people all those who see me laugh me to scorn they shoot out the lip they shake the head saying he trusted in the Lord let him rescue him let him deliver him since he delights in him for dogs have surrounded me the assembly of the wicked has enclosed me they pierced my hands and my feet I can count all my bones they look and stare at me they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots my God my God why who have you forsaken me were the very word Jesus uttered on the cross according to Mark 15 34 they pierced my hands and my feet accurately describes the wounds Jesus suffered when crucified John 19 17 to 18 and finally they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots was fulfilled to the letter according to Mark 14 24 Isaiah 53 verse 5 another historical prophecy made seven centuries before the crucifixion is Isaiah 53 this chapter along with other fascinating passages in this incredible book has caused biblical scholars to call Isaiah the fifth gospel verse 5 but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed in verse 7 we read some more remarkable prophetic statements he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened us his mouth he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth the fulfillment is seen in first Peter 2 23 to 24 who when he was reviled did not revile in return 
When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Isaiah 53, 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Its fulfillment recorded in Mark 15, 42 to 47. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking carriage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. And when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he brought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus observed where he was laid. Zechariah 11, 12. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me wages, my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Its fulfillment noted in Matthew 26, 14 to 15. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Verse 13. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they sit on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. This verse is also fulfilled in Matthew 27, 3 to 8. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elder, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, because they are the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the porous field to bury strangers in. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. We can see this same field, ladies and gentlemen, in Jerusalem to this very day. It is well attested historical fact. Zechariah 12, 10 reads, And I will pour on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This passage speaks of both the first and second advents of our Lord. Then they will look on me, whom they have pierced indicated the first coming of Jesus. The verse predicted that the Jews at some time will repent of the rejection of their Messiah and mourn for him as one mourned for his only son as they realize he is the heavenly father's one and only son. Zechariah thus sees beyond the first coming to the future when the Jews as a people and a nation will be gathered and brought back to God again. Most evangelicals believe that this return to Jerusalem occurred in 67. The next will be returning to God himself. Micah 5.2 But you, Bethlehem of Phratah, though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Since Micah lived in the time of King Hezekiah, he made this prophecy some eight centuries before the birth of, birth of Jesus. The fulfillment is recorded in Matthew 2, 1 to 9. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Malachi 3, 1. Behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. John the Baptist. This is really a double prophecy. The first part with John the Baptist, and we know the fulfillment of that in Matthew 11, 10 to 13. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will, who will prepare your way before me. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, Messiah Jesus. The second part of Malachi 3.1 deals with Jesus. He is the Lord in human flesh who came to the temple and rebuked the people. 
My house is a house of prayer to all people and you have made it in a thieves, according to Mark 11, 17. Numerous other Old Testament passages foretell the events of the crucifixion. Psalms 34, 20. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Thus was fulfilled according to John 19, 32, 33. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Psalms 69, 21. They also gave me gold for my food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Matthew 27, 34, 48 fulfills that. They gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it to an on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The record of Christ's own predictions. Unless it can be proven that Jesus did not make the following unique claims, we must in all honesty accept and believe them to be authentic. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Jesus repeatedly foretold his redemptive work on the cross, yet the disciples did not comprehend it completely. Mark 8.31 And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Luke 9.22 The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. The declaration of Peter that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God is followed by this humbling and overwhelming statement that Jesus would be killed and would rise the third day. John 3, 14 to 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here is one of the most glorious statements in the entire Bible. In the first part, we are reminded of what Moses did to save his people in the wilderness. The salvation from the biting serpents was faith. By faith, looking up to the brass serpent. This was symbolic of Jesus who knew no sin, but who became sin for us, nailing sin and Satan power on the cross. The unfathomable love of God is demonstrated by Christ's unconditional love for all sinners who repent, believe and trust him as the one who paid for our sins. The entire Christian faith can be summarized in this one verse which we have just shared with you. For God so loved the world that he sacrificed his one and only son that anyone believing in him should not perish but have everlasting life. His seven declarations on the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, Father forgive me. Luke 23, 34. Today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. Woman, behold your son, John 19, 26. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. I thirst, John 19, 28. It is finished, John 19, 30. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, Luke 23, 46. The record of the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels is a term for the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It presents a synopsis of the same series of events in the life of the Messiah, Whereas in John's gospel, the narrative and discourses are different. And uh, nobody borrowed from anybody. They were eyewitnesses. Matthew 17, 22 to 23. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. Here once again is the fact that Jesus had to be crucified, die, and be raised the third day. Mark 15, 1 to 43. All three of the Synoptics New Testament Gospels recount the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark's Gospel provides one of the most succinct accounts of the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. It is shorter because it was written to the Roman soldiers, basically. That's what the target. To conserve time, we will read only those specific verses from the passage dealing directly with his death. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? And they cried out, more exceedingly, Crucify him! So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. He already bled in the garden. He bled there from the beating. 
And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. That's nine o'clock in the morning. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood opposing him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Luke 22, 66 to 23 and 43. Luke, the Greek physician, turned gospel writer and missionary who interviewed the mother of Jesus and where, that's where he got most of his stories clearly asserted that Jesus Christ was crucified and died. Here are some of the most significant verses. But they, they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested who for insurrection and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I, commit, I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Matthew's account parallels these passages in Mark and Luke, the record of the Apostle John. No one should ever overlook the fact that John was nicknamed the beloved disciple. He was the youngest of the twelve apostles and lived to a very ripe old age, maybe even a hundred, outliving all the others. John was the one whom Peter urged to ask Jesus at the Last Supper to identify, to identify his betrayer. As an eyewitness, I repeat, as an eyewitness at the crucifixion, he relates to us one of the kindest moments in the life of Jesus. It is deeply moving to learn that Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, stopped dying long enough to demonstrate his undying love for his precious mother Mary. Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to John as John 19, 26 to 27 tells us. This is John's observation of the crucifixion and what happened to Jesus. But one of the soldiers pierced his sight with a spear and immediately blood and water came out and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. John 19, 34 to 35. John wrote the fourth gospel, the three letters with which bear his name and the book of Revelation. Let us examine excerpts from his writings concerning this very significant subject. John 19, 30 to 42. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. John 20, 6-9. Then Simon Peter came following him, following John, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linens lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed. For as he, as yet, they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. What did he see? He saw the shroud that it was a miracle that Jesus had risen and he was alive. John, 
as an eyewitness is telling us of his experience on the day of resurrection of the Messiah Jesus, it is astonishing that after all the details which Jesus gave the disciples, they still had a hard time believing that he would die and rise again. They believed after the resurrection, just like John himself. But had they remembered Psalms 49, 15, they would have known. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave for he shall receive me. The book of Acts of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Acts 2, 23 to 24. Therefore, let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2, 36. Peter's second sermon. Let it be known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone nor nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved Muhammad does not save you Moses does not save you Mary does not save you only Jesus Stephen's defense which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute and they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one referring to Jesus of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers at 752 the writing is the apostle Paul no figure in Christian history stands so tall or has had such a tremendous influence as her soul of Tarsus who later became known as the apostle Paul the passing centuries has not dimmed the luster of this personality nor altered the significance of his incredible insight into the Christian message. From the day of his conversion on the road to Damascus until his martyrdom 30 years later, Paul found love, life, liberty, light as a bond slave of Jesus Christ our Lord. I feel that if Muhammad had experienced Christ as Paul did, on the road to Damascus, he would have become the greatest Arab evangelist in the history of the world. At any rate, since Paul understood the death, resurrection, and atonement of Christ so well, his writings preserved in the New Testament are full of such references. The Christ-centered labors of this dedicated missionary evangelist so deeply rooted the faith that within three centuries the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as the state religion. The writings of Paul contain the most comprehensive theology and teaching about the person, nature, and mission of Jesus Christ because he was more educated than all the rest of the disciples, in case you don't know. John 1, 1, 8, 58, 20, 28, Titus 2, 13, Romans 9, 5 are just a few of the verses which confirm that Jesus Christ is truly God of the same nature as his heavenly Father. Romans 1, 3 to 4, Philippians 2, 5 to 11 are two Pauline passages affirming that the divine Son of God also became man. 1 Timothy 2, 5 points out the importance of the incarnation, that is, that God became man. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Christ's incarnation, death and resurrection and exaltation are eloquently summarized in Philippians 2, 8 to 11. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Apostle Paul considered the crucifixion, resurrection, and return of Jesus Christ as the most central doctrines of the Christian faith. The biblical and historical evidence overwhelmingly way outweighs the meager Quranic verses that deny these truths. The testimony of secular history. Sacred history in the New Testament documents has shown us ample evidence of the historicity of Christ's death and resurrection. Not surprisingly, secular history has far less concerning the traveling preacher from an obscure empire outpost called Nazareth. 
However, even secular history is not silent concerning Christ. Flavius Josephus. Now there was about this time, Jesus a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named for him are not extinct at this day. Josephus. The Jewish Talmud. The Talmud is a holy book of tradition and commentary in Jewish eyes. It has been collected in huge volumes, which anyone interested can see. In the copy published 1943 in Amsterdam, one can read on page 42, Jesus was crucified one day before the Passover. It is said in the prophets, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 8 to 9, You shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. God's command concerns itself with punishment for a false prophet. The Jewish elders justified their jealousy of Jesus by accusing him of being a false prophet and rebel king. That's why the crucifixion. Roman and Greek historians. The death of Christ on the cross is confirmed by early historians, heathen and Jewish. Tacitus, the historian who was a heathen, wrote in the year AD 55, detailing passages about the crucifixion of Christ and his sufferings. Furthermore, the Roman historian Pliny the Younger and Suetonius, along with non-Roman historian Thallus, Phlegion, and the satirist Lucian of Samosta, referred to the crucifixion of Jesus in their writings. Martin Hengel's book identifies that. The book is called Crucifixion in the Ancient World. The Greek historian Lucian, who lived around AD 100, was an outstanding writer. He told of the death of Christ and the growing group of Christians. He was an Epicurean who could not understand the faith of Christians and the readiness to die for Christ. One of the most significant allusions to the subject of Christ in his writings is this. The Christians continue to worship that great man who was crucified in Palestine because he brought a new religion to the world. The appearances as evidence of the resurrection. The angels announce the resurrection. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. Matthew 28, 1 to 6. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Mark 16, 5 to 6. He appeared to the woman, Mary Magdalene. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. Mark 16, 9 to 10. Other women. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened... As they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Luke 24, 1 to 8. On a mass road. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all those things that had happened. So it was, while they were conversing and reasoning, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Luke 24, 13 to 15. Private appearance to Peter. The Lord is risen indeed, 
and has appeared to Simon. Luke 24, 34. The apostles, ten of them. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now Thomas, called the twin of the twelve, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. John 20, 19 to 24. Eleven of them. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. John 20, 26 to 28. Seven of them at Galilee. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself Simon Peter Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, the son of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. John 21, 1 to 2. To the eleven on a mountain in Galilee. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Matthew 28, 16 to 17. To the eleven at Mount Olives. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Luke 24, 51. Appeared to James. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Appeared to Paul on Damascus Road. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round about him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Acts 9, 3 to 5. The book of Revelation has a profound and powerful statement, which Jesus in glory addresses the apostle John. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last titles of God I am he who lives and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore Amen Revelation 1 17 to 18 John tells us of what he did when he saw the living Messiah in glory and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead verse 17 what would you do? And what would I do when we face the living Christ? We should do exactly as John did. Bow down ourselves in worship and adoration. The declaration which Jesus made prior to John's worshipful experience is sufficient proof to any living soul as to the awesome personality of Jesus the Messiah. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Revelation 1.11 It must be emphasized that Jewish Islamic and Christian theologians across the centuries of time are consistent in the agreement that such words identify God Almighty and only God Almighty. So here is Jesus, the Messiah, inviting you to believe that he is the resurrection and the life. By repentance from sin and faith in him and what he accomplished on the cross, you can be assured of forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Why not tonight? No Muslim is assured of his forgiveness of sin while he is on earth. He's hoping later. There was a summit meeting held on Mount Tabor, which included two prominent figures and Messiah Jesus. Here is the record by Dr. Luke, 930 to 31. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. How in the world do you accomplish death? How did the three disciples recognize Moses and Elijah? Elijah may have been simply declaring, Moses, when you place the blood of the lamb on the doors of the homes of your people in Egypt, you are pointing to this lamb of God. His blood will save anyone from the angel of death. Moses may have responded, well, Elijah, when the sacrifice on Mount Carmel was consumed by God's fire, that was a type of the eternal sacrifice Jesus was to make for all humanity. Not only did the people cry out, the Lord, he is God, but also the entire creation one day will cry out, Messiah Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. But now, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, 
By man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 20-22. For by your works you will be justified, and by your works you will be condemned. May I share with you something very personal. We can discuss, argue, and present our evidences. The truth is, when I was raised in Nazareth, at age three, my father disappeared. I did not know why. Four children were raised by my mother. Finally, I found out that my father had come to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, not as a religion, for he was a Christian by name and by birth, but as a personal experience. He was so joyful, so happy, founding a treasure. He wanted to share it with others. And one of the experiences on a train, unfortunately, a fanatic mob attacked him. To this day, I do not know whether he jumped off the train or they pushed him off. My father, ladies and gentlemen, was hospitalized for 11 years. When I saw him, I just barely was a teenager. And as we fled on Camelback by night to the land of Jordan, he tried to follow us, for he had come back, stepped on the landmine, and was killed. Did not know where he was buried till just a few years ago. At age 18, four years after this, in 1951, I had run out of answers to what is going on in the Middle East. The Arabs, the Jews, the Muslims, and all of that. And having learned the gospel, having memorized the Sermon on the Mount and many passages, they were only memories. For we have a lot of people who don't know Arabic who memorize the Quran. But it's like a parakeet. They don't know what they're saying. Half of the people who read the Quran hardly understand a fourth of it. Be that as it may, the interesting thing was, I found myself on my knees in the little room by myself where other refugees were living in tents. We lived at least in one room. My mother, my brother, my sister and I. My older brother was making a living for us. And I asked God if he's real to let me know. If he existed, let me know. And if he really knows that I exist, let him talk to me. How does he communicate with you? How does God communicate with you? Angels? prophets, books, but he can talk your language and he speaks more than Arabic and English. And like a voice from heaven, take and read. Dear friends, we had only one Bible for my mother. I picked it up and began to read these incredible words. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I told God, I am so sinful, I don't qualify to be a citizen of the kingdom. But if he'll accept me, he has to prove himself. All these things will mean to me, after I surrender myself to him, number one, I needed a job. But more important than that, I needed a cleansing of heart. My hatred toward the Arabs, my Muslim people, for causing my father to disappear from my home. My Jewish people who have taken my home and caused the death of my father. The whole world who does not seem to care about Palestinians or anybody else. And I asked God to do that. My dear friends, I testify to you at 3.30 that Friday afternoon in that Easter weekend of 1951, I got off my knees a changed man. I opened the door. I thought I had been in a coma all that time. God changed my life. I never knew what would happen next. But within short order, two years, I landed in America as a student going to college from the seventh grade. A miracle if you ever heard of one. And as a student to study medicine, God called me to the ministry. My interest has been in our people. But one day, I could see the world. It's 1966. And since then, I've been doing that. But in 1985, when I heard Mr. Didat speak in the city of London, and I felt a compulsion to share the truth with my beloved Muslim friends. I got my second doctorate in Islamics. I have risked my life. And I will tell you openly, in one day, we received 50 threats on my life from our beloved Muslim friends. I have risked my life 11 times. I was stabbed almost, except God sent a man who covered me the size of our dear brother, the doctor. And you know what? I love you so much. I'm willing to risk my life a thousand times if it will open your eyes to see 
that our God is a loving God. He's not a vengeful God. He's not a deceitful God. He wants you to know the truth. He wants you to follow him, love him, and love each other. We live in a world like a global village. It is high time to forget what others said. Let's hear what God says. He loves you. And that's why he sent Jesus. And I love you too. And I'm willing to live my life that you may know the truth that can set you free. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hopefully we'll get Dr. Shubir, oh, Dr. Shubir to come back and uh, do his first rebuttal for 18 minutes. Are we okay? Thank you very much, Dr. Shirosh, for that excellent presentation and also for that moving personal story at the end. In fact, I wasn't aware of this story and uh, knowing this story helps me to appreciate you as a person and to respect you as an individual. Uh, we all have uh, personal stories to tell, individual lives that we have lived and uh, we can uh, learn from each other in forums such, uh, such as this. Sometimes we look at the behavior of people and we uh, might misunderstand uh, that uh, behavior unless we know what gives rise to that sort of uh, behavior. Uh, of course, my own personal story is that uh, when I grew up in Islam, uh, though I was born uh, to Muslim parents, uh, Islam was not a living reality in my life. But when I was about 14 years old, uh, the imam of our village came to invite my father and brother, uh, elder brother, to go to the mosque. And I thought that the imam made sense and his message rang through to me much more to, to, than to the ones to whom it was uh, delivered. I started going to the mosque and learned how to pray. And the more I, I learned about Islam, the more I appreciated that Islam is a very reasonable set of beliefs and practices, the more I fell into in love with Islam and in love with the God of Islam and with the Prophet of Islam. And I decided to make uh, Islam my life effort. But uh, enough about personal stories, we, we also need to look at the facts and, and evidence before us. One of the things that Dr. Shirosh is asking us repeatedly these nights is, uh, and these days is whether or not Muslims have a personal assurance that they will be saved as Christians uh, feel they have. First, uh, we should say that in fact uh, both Muslims and Christians have a certain reasonable degree of assurance within their tradition that uh, they are saved. Uh, but at the same time, both have uh, a reasonable degree of caution as well. And uh, often our Muslim friends are more concerned about the caution and our Christian friends are more, assured, uh, are more concerned with the assurance. Yeah. But, but bear in mind that even for our Christian friends, there is an important caution. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says that on that day, I will say to many, get away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. Right. And these supposed evildoers are the very ones who would say, uh, we, we performed so many mighty miracles in your name. They were performing good deeds and miracles and all of that, but at the same time, Jesus will disown them. So don't uh, walk around with the chip on your shoulder, either Muslim or Christian, saying that because I recited the Kalima of Islam, I'm saved, or because I believe in Christ, I'm saved. Uh, what comes after you have expressed uh, that uh, belief. So I think Muslims and Christians are together on that uh, point. It's not one that we need to belabor. Now, you'll recall, folks, that in my initial presentation, I made five significant points. I said, first of all, that uh, one cannot prove that Jesus actually died on the cross. Second, that one cannot prove that Jesus really reappeared from the dead because the, the reports that show that he reappeared do not give the assurance that the initial eyewitnesses actually identified him uh, as the real Jesus. Moreover, the reports are so uh, developed over time and we can see the evolution from one gospel to another that uh, our confidence significantly diminishes as we read the gospels and compare them. So we do not have any reassurance that in fact, or any firm assurance that Jesus really reappeared from the dead. Third, I've shown that in fact it is the apologist for the Christian side who has the obligation and the burden of proof to show that Jesus actually first of all died on the cross because if he didn't die on the cross then he didn't really die for our sins and second that he really reappeared from the dead uh, because if he did not reappear from the dead then his death would disprove him 
The dust would prove actually that he is a false messiah and false prophet. A lot of Dr. Shirosh's uh, presentation tried to argue that Jesus is really God. But that's arguing from within the Bible to prove the Bible. Remember how the argument has to go. Because if Jesus' death on the cross would prove him to be the false messiah and false prophet, then he, by definition he's not God. One then has to prove that he really reappeared from the dead and proved himself to uh, have conquered uh, death. Fourth, I've argued, uh, though I did not have time to elaborate, that it is uh, pointless to say that Jesus died for our sins. It was rather uh, better to say that God forgives our sins. And even our Christian friends will say, even after all is said and done, Jesus died in everything, you still depend on the forgiveness of God. So we're still back to square one, even with the crucifixion of Jesus. Then what difference did that make? And finally, I've referred to the Quran to show the Quranic uh, view, the way it has been interpreted, uh, especially by modern scholars. Now, Dr. Shiroz began by saying that Shabir has admit admitted what no Muslim has ever believed. Now, uh, you will recall from my presentation, however, that I've said that uh, this interpretation goes as far back as the Makhshari in his Al-Kashaf, and it has been followed by Muhammad Asad in his uh, meaning of the Quran. Uh, it is what has been expressed by Rukhaya Waris Maksud, uh, a lady from this country who has written an excellent book, The Mysteries of Jesus. And also the same view is expressed by Tarif Khalidi, a scholar from Cambridge, in his book, The Muslim Jesus. So I think after having heard all of that, uh, to come and make a statement like that, Dr. Shirosh, is really irresponsible. <laughs> now, you know, typing your opinion, you know. <laughs> I, I wanted to hear from Dr. Shirosh uh, his um, re specific replies to the five uh, areas that I have um, uh, so delineated, uh, but uh, I was disappointed because he in fact did not really tackle the problems as I put them forward. The, the closest he got to that was when he uh, described the secular historians and what they had to say about Jesus. But what he has quoted from the secular historians do not in fact deal with my specific point. You see, if Jesus in fact came down alive from the cross, suppose he was put in the tomb and then he finally died in the tomb. If we suppose that, what would a historian write? A historian would have to write that Jesus died. Now suppose the tomb was empty and the body of Jesus went missing. What would a historian write? A historian would write that he's missing and presumed dead. Or just simply that he is dead. From the point of view of secular history, Jesus died. From the point of view of Muslim theology, Jesus is alive. God raised him to life. But no historian will record that because if we had a video camera there on the scene, no, no video camera would capture the imagery of Jesus being raised by God. So then finally, none of these historians actually do the trick. First of all, starting with Josephus. Did you realize, Dr. Shiroz, that the passage you read from Josephus actually includes what is called a pious Christian fraud? Did you realize? that uh, Christians have actually worked in to Josephus statements which could never have come from the Jewish Josephus recognizing Jesus as the Messiah he wouldn't be a, uh, he wouldn't remain a Jew he would be a Christian if uh, Jesus is to be if he can be called a man Josephus is made to write no according to uh, uh, scholars who have worked on this for example Graham Stanton a scholar from uh, King's College uh, London uh, University of London in his book Gospel Truth uh, these are pious frauds inserted into Josephus' statement. Uh, a similar statement can be found in uh, the book The Pagan Christ by an Anglican priest from Toronto uh, who has written that uh, recent book. And in fact, he has said that there's been a long history of such pious frauds. We cannot therefore use Josephus for that. If we exclude the insertion, then all Josephus can say, writing uh, some 30 years after the event, is that Jesus was crucified. But I did not deny, uh, if we understand crucifixion to mean hung on a cross, I did not deny that. But if we assume or understand crucifixion according to the definition given by Maulana Abdul Majid Daryabadi in his uh, Tafsir al-Quran, crucifixion meaning a killing by hanging on a cross, then in fact it did not accomplish this task. What I understand the Quran to be saying is along these lines. Suppose uh, there was uh, a person who was uh, 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 working for a good cause, but he was captured uh, by a rogue state and hanged. But we rescued him before he died. Now the rogue state claims we hanged him. And we say, no you didn't. 
Now from the, when they say they hanged him, they mean they actually killed him by hanging. But when we say no you didn't, we mean no you didn't finally accomplish what your objective was. It seems that the Quran in dialectic opposition to the Jews who claim that they had killed Jesus is saying no you didn't. They say but we crucified him and the Quran is saying no you didn't. So ma kataluhu wa ma salabuhu wa lakin halahum. They killed him not nor crucified him but it was made so to appear to them. And then the Quranic verse concludes by saying uh, that uh, th they have no certain knowledge concerning this. They are in doubt concerning him wa ma kataluhu yaqina. But they didn't kill him for certain. And that seems to be the whole point of, of the verse. So none of these historians actually would prove the point that somebody verified the death of Jesus. And that is what uh, Dr. Shirosh has to prove. What would verify the death of Jesus? Apparently from the Gospel according to Mark, it, it was doubtful that Jesus actually had expired so soon. So if we look at the Talmud for example, we're, uh, we are assured that they have dealt with Jesus as a false prophet and killed him. Well then, this is the Talmud written some hundreds of years after the event. The Palestinian Talmud in the 5th century, the Babylonian Talmud in the 6th. And therefore we have hundreds of years after Jesus, this is being written. Nobody can assure us after this uh, length of time that they know for sure that Jesus had actually expired on the cross. Certainly it was the Jewish line that we killed him as a false prophet. But uh, the Quran is saying, no you didn't. You didn't actually accomplish the job of killing him because God rescued him and raised him to him. Himself. Similarly, Tacitus and Pliny and Thales and Lucian and all of these, these are later writers. You yourself said that Lucian was writing around the AD 100. So AD 100, that means 70 years after the event. Naturally, they are towing the popular line that they have heard from others. And they're giving us the story that is popular, that Jesus was crucified. The Quran gives us a new insight that while they tried to crucify Jesus, they in fact were not successful. So I think that Dr. Shirosh has the real burden of proof to come back and prove to us that Jesus really died on the cross, that he reappeared after he had, dead, uh, had been once dead, that uh, he really died for the sins of humankind, that there is a real need for such a person to die for us. And uh, I don't think he will be able to do that tonight. Now... He said that Paul was more educated than the disciples. I do not doubt that education. But to think that Paul was more informed about the life and teachings of Jesus than his disciples, I think is a fallacy. Certainly those who lived and walked with Jesus and were taught by him for many years knew more about him than Paul did. And Paul introduced a new uh, teaching. It was Paul who in fact introduced this as a problem. He said that Jesus died as a curse. So now if you start by condemning him, now you have to rescue him. Uh, Dr. Shirosh read a verse from the Gospel according to Luke where it says the two other criminals. Two other criminals? That means Jesus was also a criminal, Dr. Shirosh? In our place, yes. Okay. So you see then, if Jesus died as a criminal, as Dr. Shirosh is saying, and as Paul said that Jesus died as a, cro uh, as a curse, well then, uh, you have to now reverse the charge. Somebody has to come to defend him. That establishes what I established before. That the burden of proof is on somebody who says that Jesus is after all good. Because if to all appearances he died as a criminal under the curse of God, then nobody should presume that God raised him from the dead. Because the God does not raise criminals from the dead. God does not uh, raise from the dead those whom uh, he has caused to, have, to be killed under his own curse. So if someone has some overwhelming evidence to say, no, wait a minute, though it looks like Jesus died as a curse, there is such overwhelming evidence for a reversal of the charge and a reversal of the conviction, because that's what it's amount to now. Unless anyone comes with that sort of proof, we should conclude then, based on the gospel evidence, that Jesus died the death of an accursed person. In that case, we would have no reason to believe him. Of course, Muslims do believe in Jesus. But Dr. Shirosh wants to call Muslims to stop believing in the Quran, stop believing in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he hopes then, but that by doing so, we would believe in, in, this, in Jesus. Amen. But the point is, that if you stop believing in the Quran, if you stop believing in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and you examine the Gospels and examine the Christian story, you would come to the point where Jesus dies the death of an accursed person, and you would be left with not sufficient evidence that he actually rose from the dead. So you would have no reason for reversing that initial conviction. Now I might say, but why believe in the conviction if you don't want to believe in the reversal? 
Well, when the conviction is coming from the friends and supporters and believers in Jesus, that should be believed. Because that is, uh, not, uh, that is friendly testimony against the victim. But when that same friendly testimony in favor of the victim is given, we do not have the same reason for believing it. So we need evidence and proof. We do not have that evidence and, and proof from what uh, Dr. Shirosh has presented. Now, what about Paul saying in 1 Corinthians that Jesus appeared to the twelve? You see, this shows the contradiction. Because there was no time when Jesus appeared to the twelve, Dr. Shirosh. By this time, Judas Iscariot was long gone. So there was only eleven. And Paul, therefore, does not have first-hand information. But when G Paul says that Jesus appeared, that could be a spiritual appearance. And Muslims do not deny that Jesus might have appeared in a spiritual vision uh, to his disciples as a way of assuring them that Jesus is alive with God. What you need to prove is that Jesus physically died on the cross and he physically came back to life. As Norman Geisler has written about this in his book, Battle for the Resurrection, what you really need is proof that Jesus actually got up, his dead body got up and walked out of that tomb. Just like you see it in the Passion of the Christ in the last uh, glimpse there. So you need some proof like that. But of course there is no such uh, proof. And Paul's uh, statement does not amount to that proof. Now, what about the cross uh, as a symbol? Well, the fact that so many people believe in the thing does not mean the thing is true. Many people wear crosses. It doesn't mean that this actually is a proof that Jesus resurrected from the dead. In fact, the cross is a very ancient symbol. Uh, but uh, that, of course, is not uh, our point today. That the tomb is empty. Dr. Shiroz, do you realize that there, is, that there are different opinions about which exactly is the tomb of Jesus? Nobody knows exactly which is that tomb. Some say it's the garden tomb. Some say it's a tomb at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And that, uh, that shows that nobody knows for sure where the tomb of Jesus really is. Now, what about um, uh, Jesus appearing to his disciples, uh, such as in Matthew's Gospel and so on? You look at what Dr. Shirosh has quoted. Some doubt it. That is exactly my point. When Jesus appeared to his disciples and they saw him, and worshipped him, why did some doubt? In fact, saying some doubted is a way of, of blunting the edge of the problem here. The real translation is that they doubted. Not just some of the disciples doubted, but the disciples doubted. That means that even after all is said and done, and they, they don't uh, have the surety that they really saw Jesus. So who appeared to them then? All right, Jesus comes in and he shows them, you know, put your hand, your finger here. And so he has the marks of crucifixion. You have a person who doesn't look like Jesus, who doesn't sound like Jesus, but he looks like he had been crucified. If this was really Jesus appearing to his disciples, why do they not recognize him from his face and voice? We should have somebody come forward with confidence and say, yes, we saw him and we recognize him then there's no re reason to talk about his nail wound and his side wound and his dental records and his shoe size and, and, and so on. Because the matter will be done. They saw him, they recognized him, they were assured that he came back to life. But all of the records show that in fact th th there is some confusion about what, what they saw. Also, where did they see Jesus? If you try to examine the records carefully, you will see that there is no assurance that they are all put together in a coherent narrative. For example, did Jesus appear in Galilee or did he appear in Jerusalem? When he appears to them in Jerusalem, according to Luke's gospel, Luke tells, uh, Jesus tells them, stay in the city. So when exactly, Dr. Shirosh, did they go to Galilee to see Jesus on the mount where Matthew depicts? So Matthew is in direct contradiction with Luke. So too is Mark, because Mark says, go to Galilee, there you will see him. Do you realize that the words of the angels that you quoted have actually been changed in order to reflect this difference, whether you stay in Galilee or you go away? So you have a lot to deal with. You have to prove that Jesus really died from on the cross and prove that he really reappeared to his disciples. Thank you very much. Okay. So the show
I'd like to ask you a very simple question. Since my wonderful opponent does not believe the Talmud stories coming 600 or 500 years after the fact, why should I believe the Quran that came 600 years after the fact of the crucifixion and the life of Christ? Simple enough. Jesus was crucified for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That's why he took the blame. That's why he became a curse in our place. He took our place. Redemption is a missing link in Islam. That's why he doesn't understand it. I can appreciate that. As for the twelve disciples, they had chosen Matthias. He apparently does not remember the book of Acts, which I'm sure he read. As for recognizing him, I'd like to know if he were dead after he'd been beaten and crucified, would his wife recognize him? I doubt it. That's why some people wondered. A friend who had died coming back to life, what would you do? Surely some of you would wonder as to recognizing him. And since he was here for 40 days after his resurrection, he could be in Galilee, he could be in Jerusalem, he could be in Bethany, he could be in Bethlehem, he could be anywhere. But now, to this rebuttal, the 18-minute rebuttal, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ according to the Quran is very confusing to the average reader. This is partially due to the fact that there is no sequence to the events in a single surah. The information is scattered as well as mixed up. However, upon a closer look and scrutiny, the researcher or investigator will be mystified how close the Quran comes to describing the truth. What is the truth concerning this very fundamental doctrine over two billion people on this planet? It is, of course, that Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of God, or God the Son, was crucified on a Roman cross, died, was buried in a borrowed tomb, but rose the third day, ascended to heaven, and one day will return. Both Old and New Testaments testify of that. Eyewitnesses reported that as a fact. Now let's look at what the Quran states. Please do not forget that with all respect to the Quranic record and Muhammad, he was never an eyewitness, nor was he ever in Jerusalem except in a dream, nor was the Quran written anywhere close to the time of the events. Nevertheless, we have very helpful materials borrowed from the Bible for sure. The record of the Quran, 4, 157, 158. Because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger, they slew him not, nor crucified him, but it appeared so unto them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. But Allah took him up unto himself. Allah was ever mighty wise. The cross, in Islam's estimation, unfortunately, was not the historical event or the basis of a doctrine of redemption. It was a symbol or a sign like the star which guided the Magi to the cradle of the child in Bethlehem or like the appearance of the Holy Spirit as a dove descending upon Christ at his baptism in the Jordan. But the heavy cross on which Christ was hanged, which is the altar of redemption for humanity where the Lamb of God was sacrificed to take away the sin of the world is of no real importance to Muslims, unfortunately. The famous Muslim scholar and commentator Al Jalalam, in his interpretation of the Quranic phrase, says, It appeared so unto them, Shubbi Alahum, says that Allah caused the likeness of Isa to be upon the dead man, because they thought he was Isa, they killed and crucified him. The phrase, those who disagreed and are in doubt about him, that is about Isa regarding his death, means that some of them, when they saw the dead man, said, The face is the face of Isa, but the body is not his body. Others said, It is he. Why would God deceive us? al we said, it is related that a group of Jews captured Isa and his mother. He cursed them and they were changed into apes and pigs. What an exciting report. The Jews met together to kill him, but God told him he would take him to heaven. He said to his friends, who is ready to take my likeness upon him and be killed and crucified and enter paradise? One of them responded, and God cast the likeness of Isa upon him. He was killed by crucifixion. Surah 355, the family of Imran. And remember when Allah said, O Jesus, lo, I am gathering thee and causing thee to ascend unto me. It's called Allah, Ya Isa, inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka alayya. Ali translates accurately the word and says, I will cause thee to die rather than I'm gathering thee. As an Arab who has been raised in a Muslim culture, Arabic is my native language, the critical word mutawafika means cause you to die. 
confusion arising from various interpretations of this word has cast a shadow over the truth of the death of Christ. Even until this day, 1400 years after the appearance of the Quran, you can ask any Arab about what happened to his uncle who passed away last week. He will use the same word as a past tense and say, Tawaffa, which means he died. Since that term is used of Jesus, he must have died. It's very revealing to discover in Surah 2, 234, this verse. Such of you as die and leave behind them wives, the Arabic word is translated properly as die. Then we observe in the same chapter, verse 240, in the case of those of you who are about to die and leave behind them wives, although the same Arabic wording for verse 234 is repeated here, this is a poor translation. However, the important thing is the word yatawafuna is again translated as die. So I would like to have an explanation from the Muslim scholars. Why are they not willing to admit that the word about Jesus, tawafaitani, actually means you caused me to die? I debated Mr. Ahmadida twice. And he's produced many books and booklets. This is one of them. Let me read to you. This is supposed to teach people how to pray Islamic culture. Let me read to you what he says here. He has here written, وَمَنْ تَوَفَّيْتَهُ مِنَّا فَتَوَفَّاهُ عَلَى الْإِيمَانِ And be to whom you gave death, cause him to die in the state of Iman. Once again, وَمَنْ تَوَفَّيْتَهُ مِنَّا فَتَوَفَّاهُ عَلَى الْإِيمَانِ And be to whom you gave death, cause him to die in the state of Iman. So what do you have here? In this book, modern book, same thing. Now may I say, that in Surah 1933, we have peace on me, most powerful, that the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I shall be raised alive. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ This is a marvelous verse, a clear confession, that Christ became incarnate, died, and was raised from the dead. Moreover, this verse was done, this action was done according to prophecy and based on miracles. This is one of the clearest passages in the Quran on the subject and it agrees with the gospel narrative. During the first debate I attended in 1985, July the 7th, Mr. Didat was debating Dr. Floyd Clark of Tennessee in London's Albert Hall. During the question and answer period, I asked the question, does the Quran contradict itself? The question was related to this very verse, as I quoted in the Arabic before the entire crowd of people in that gigantic hall. To my utter astonishment, Mr. Didat responded, the first part of the sentence was in the past tense, peace on me the day I was born. Then he went to say, the day I die and the day I shall be raised alive is future tense. It has not happened yet. There was no more opportunity for a rebuttal, but it was revelation to me, a great revelation to me, how clever and artful a person can be, even my friend Shabir, in explaining away what he does not want to believe. The reason why Jesus used future tense is very simple. He was speaking as a child in a cradle, according to the Quran, when he said these words, and neither death nor resurrection had yet taken place, but both events did occur when he was 30 years of age. 33 years of age. What a contradiction Mr. Death presented that evening, just like we hear tonight. Jesus did not swoon, friend. The spear killed him and proved he was dead. Surah 5, 116, 117. When Allah saith, O Jesus, son of Mary, this thou say unto mankind, take me and my mother for two gods besides Allah. This particular passage in its entirety is certainly a powerful one against the heretic Miriamites who had made Mary a goddess, Jesus her son, and God Almighty her husband. This definitely is blasphemy and certainly is not accepted by true Christians who believe in the Holy Bible. So we have no argument with this particular statement at all, once it is understood clearly and correctly. However, thou tookest me is tawafaitani in Arabic and means cause me to die. It is another verse acknowledging the death of Jesus Christ for the sinful human race. When the religious leaders during that time hung Jesus upon the cross and he died, 
He was put in the tomb of Joseph Arimathea. A stone was rolled over the entrance of the tomb. And following Pilate's orders, it was sealed. The Jews rejoiced, thinking that they were finally secure from his teaching and miracles. It was their hope that his cruel death was enough to prevent his followers from any further activity. But it was not to be so. Jesus' atoning death on the cross and subsequent resurrection had attracted thousands of believers in Jerusalem itself. And on the first day of the preaching, 3,000 were saved. Today, the largest number of followers of any religion are indeed the followers of Jesus Christ in 216 countries of the world. In John, 1, 12, in John 12, 32, Jesus himself affirmed, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Once again, we look at this passage from Surah 4, 157. Those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of conjecture. They slew him not for certain. The contemporaries of Jesus confidently tell us that he did die and rose the third day because they were eyewitnesses. During the 40 days after the resurrection, he appeared to as many as 500 people at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, 6, I read to you a while ago. So is Matthew 28, 11 to 15. Then he ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God in keeping with the Quranic statement in Surah Al-Imran 3.55. Inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya. Lo, I am gathering thee and causing thee to ascend unto me. Isn't it marvelous to recognize the truth when it is investigated thoroughly rather than interpreted according to one's own biased opinion? Ali's translation of this, by the way, I will cause thee to die. Possible solution for the denial of the crucifixion. May I again try to shed some light on possible reasons why the crucifixion is denied in the Quran. The Jews were the ones who made the assertion that they had killed the Messiah Jesus. Is it possible that Muhammad was extremely concerned that if such a towering personality as Jesus could be killed, maybe he too might be killed. Therefore he chose to deny the whole episode. Second, to declare that the crucifixion was not done by the Jews must have been some comfort to Muhammad. The Meccans had tried to kill him and he fled to Yathrib, which later became Medina. Third, the fake gospel of Matthew, which his wife's uncle, Waraka bin Nofal, had translated from Hebrew to Arabic, had expressed that same view. The guards who reported the resurrection to the Jewish leaders were bribed to tell that the disciples had stolen the body. But when Jesus began to appear to the disciples, the Jewish leaders could not figure out what happened and may have indeed thought that they had not killed him after all. Four, it is very interesting that this agreement among the Jewish leaders as to what happened to the body of Jesus is indeed an explanation of the confusion that settled upon them. In other words, they could not explain the resurrection. That conviction is reflected in the experience of the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 13 to 20, 35. Apparently, the disagreement among the Jews is a strong testimony as to the fact that they really did not comprehend the fantastic miracle of the resurrection. The Pharisees, ladies and gentlemen, believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. The Gospels, of course, clarify the supernatural event by a large number of eyewitnesses, as I shared with you. Six, Jesus arose from the dead. His tomb was empty. Numerous witnesses were circulating the story in Jerusalem. Thus, the Jewish leaders concluded that somehow he was alive. Of course, no one should forget that the Roman law, Mr. Shabir Ali, demands that the crucified persons must be dead before they are brought down from the cross. That's why the spear went in his side to ascertain that. It's exciting to recognize that the Quran accepts the beautiful truth that Jesus was lifted up to heaven and is alive. In John 12, 32, we see the agreement. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Here is the order of the entire momentous event. The crucifixion took place first, followed by the death of Messiah Jesus, then the burial and the sealing of the tomb, followed by the resurrection on the third day. For the next 40 days, to provide infallible evidence of the resurrection, Jesus appeared 12 different times and then ascended on high, plus another appearance to Paul. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, 
Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Acts 1, 9 to 11. There are too many details by our witnesses to the crucifixion, resurrection and ascension to be denied by a handful of Quranic verses. Please remember that truth. We ask two questions. Who crucified Jesus? We know that the Romans did. Pilate ordered it because Jesus of Nazareth admitted that he was king. The sign read, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. The political challenge to Caesar demanded punishment by crucifixion. Second, the jealous religious leader screamed for his death because Jesus claimed to be God. Here is Lazarus after he was dead for four days because they feared his popularity would cause rebellion. Why was Jesus crucified? God had announced 1500 years before Messiah Jesus was born in Leviticus 1711 and listen very carefully for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul not a trip to Jerusalem not a trip to Mecca therefore we learn this truth again in Hebrews 9 20 to 28 and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood there is no remission for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands which are copies of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us but now once at the end of the ages he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as it is appointed for men to die once but after this the judgment so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many great Abraham could not provide the sacrifice even though he was willing to offer his son Isaac God Almighty had to provide the sacrifice in the Hebrew language Abraham told his son Isaac that God himself will provide himself as a sacrifice the Quran admits that God Almighty redeemed Abraham's son with a great sacrifice that event in the history of God's revelation was pointing to Jesus who would be your and my substitute. John the baptizer announced, Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. The justice of God demands payment for our sins. The terrible truth is we individually are responsible for the death of Christ because he took our place as full payment for our sins. He had announced, Greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his friends. John the eyewitness tells us in 1934 that blood and water burst forth that indicated that the heart of the crucified Jesus had already burst within him with the sorrow of bearing the sins of the world thus the blood from the heart was already mixed with the cardiac sac liquid which normally protects the heart. Pilate would not grant the body of Jesus for burial until he himself was sure that Jesus was dead. Jesus of Nazareth came to earth as the incar incarnate son of God for one purpose and that is to save sinners that is why he came that's why he declared for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost shall we accept his offer of salvation because he paid in full for our sins salvation is yours and mine for the asking by faith he loves you and loves you very much thank you nine and nine and four and four yeah, nine and nine. we changed that yesterday today has gone back to normal yeah. Yesterday was only because of the constraints of time, and because we had prayers at night. Well, I had prepared otherwise because you changed it. So we just stick with the nine minutes then. No. Okay. Uh -huh. Do I need both? Now, uh, folks. Uh, my original point still remain. I don't think that Dr. Shirosh has provo provided clear evidence that Jesus actually died. He appeals to passages in the Gospels uh, without actually showing awareness of the problem that I have uh, previously um, uh, outlined. You cannot just simply quote from the Gospel according to John to show that there was a spear wound because scholar scholars concerned about the history uh, do not consider this to be an authentic uh, event uh, that Jesus really was speared in the side. This is John's later attempt to convince us that Jesus actually died, but um, it, that is not an historical uh, event. If that was actually done, you would expect that all of the gospel writers would have written about it because everybody wants to prove that Jesus really died. Uh, especially Matthew and Luke want to prove that because we know that they have omitted the passage uh, or the phrase in Mark's gospel which says that Pilate was amazed that he was dead. 
Uh, so they didn't want people to think that Jesus wasn't dead. They could have easily mentioned the spear wound. That would have settled the issue. But they didn't because that was not historical. John uh, invented that later on. Now, <coughs> Dr. Shiroch thinks that Pilate would have certainly seen to it that Jesus died. But remember what he himself admitted. Pilate did not want Jesus dead. Pilate was being forced into this and he was going along, dragging his feet. So if there was a way that he, Jesus could still be alive, Pilate would let him go. If he could fulfill the letter of the Roman law and still hope that Jesus would be alive, then this would be killing two birds with one stone. That was good for Pilate. So in the end, we do not have any clear evidence that Jesus actually died on the, on the cross. Now, what about his uh, reappearance to his disciples? Uh, Dr. Uh, Sharosh again quotes uh, the several uh, testimonies from within the Gospels and the writings of Paul. But uh, this again is testimony coming after the fact by people who already believe this. We do not have any independent uh, eyewitness testimony. And these eyewitnesses themselves do not recognize Jesus. And uh, Dr. Sharosh has admitted that. But he gives a reason. He says that's because Jesus had been beaten. But of course, these disciples had seen him in his beaten state. So they know what he looks like in his beaten state. So when he reappears to them in the same state, Dr. Shirosh, they should have no difficulty recognizing him as they recognized him while he was on the cross. And I think you were quite wrong in saying that Matthias makes up the twelve that Jesus could have appeared to. Because if you read Acts of the Apostles, you'll see that Matthias was chosen after the ascension. So he was not one of the twelve to whom Jesus appeared. So there was no twelve. So not only you are wrong, but Paul is wrong. And that was my initial point, which you tried to defend. Don't try to defend Paul because you, you become wrong as well when you try to do that. <laughs> now, if we're not to, de to believe the Talmud, which was written f 500 years after Jesus, why should we believe the Quran? Well, Muslims do not believe the Talmud to be the word of God. Christians do not believe the Talmud to be the word of God. But Muslims do believe the Quran to be the word of God. So Muslims can believe in the Quran. Now, of course, if Muslims can demonstrate to Christians that the Quran is the word of God, then they would appeal to Christians to believe in the Quran's message as well. But so far, I didn't say tonight that you should believe in what the Quran said because the Quran is the word of God. I didn't say that. What I said is that it is the obligation of the Christian to prove that Jesus really died on the cross, and it is his obligation to prove that Jesus resurrected from the dead. If the Christian does not prove this, then the Muslim will continue to believe in Jesus as the Quran tells Muslims to believe. But if the Christian says, you Muslims are wrong for believing in the Quran, we'll say, okay, so we don't believe anything, tell me about Jesus. Or you tell me that he was crucified as an accursed person, dying under the curse of God, okay, what next? You say he was raised from the dead? Well, I have no reason for believing that. You say, well, why did you believe me when I said he was crucified and died as an accursed person? I said, because you're a friend of Jesus and you're telling me that something is wrong about him. Uh, that seems uh, believable. But if you tell me that something was good about him and you're his friend, I, I will require some evidence and proof. Especially when you're telling me something so spectacular. You tell me that a certain person was uh, put on the electric chair uh, last Monday. And I say, oh, poor guy. Uh, th that's believable, because it's not so spectacular. People are put on the electric chair from time to time. But then you tell me, you know that guy who was put on the electric chair last Monday? He's alive again. I say, wait a minute. What proof do you have of that? Do you have some newspaper clippings that is dependable? Don't give me the tabloids. Give me like some firm, uh, respectable newspaper uh, articles about this. I want proof because you're claiming something spectacular. If anyone claims that Jesus is alive after he had been dead, they have to provide the proof. And we can see that there is no real proof that in the first place he was dead, and that in the second place he re reappeared alive to his disciples. Now, uh, Dr. Shirosh thinks that the Quran confirms that Jesus died. And you notice here that he's actually, in using the Quran, he is replying to a, a, a position which is not the position that I have put forward today. And this again is the peril of the prepared speech. He has come prepared to attack a different position which is not the position that I have explained. If you say that mutawafika means I'm causing you to die, this of course is what has been reported by Mawab bin Manabba in the Tafsir of Ibn Kathir, where he says that God caused Jesus to die for seven hours and then he raised him to himself. Some scholars thought, however,
however, that it means that God put him to sleep. Because Dr. Shirosh, if you trace the etymology of this, tawaffa is used in the Arabic as a euphemism for death. The real word for death in Arabic is maut. But just as in English we say passing away, instead of saying doubt, which sounds very cruel, instead of saying death, which sounds very cruel, just similarly in Arabic we say tawaffa for the act of God taking the person back. But the real meaning of the word tawaffa is taking back. So you can take a person in sleep as well as the Quran says in Surah Al-Zumar that he is the one yatawaffal an fusahina mawtiha awallati lam tamut fi manamiha. He is the one who takes the souls at the time of death and even the souls that have not died but during their sleep. So it could be that God took Jesus in some way that what might resemble death to the outsiders, but from the point of view of God, he's not killing Jesus, he's taking Jesus in, in a loving and kind way that can be described as sleep as well. We can say therefore that the Quran here uses a term that could be interpreted two ways. From the point of view of history, it will be said that Jesus is dead, but from the point of view of theology and faith, it will be said that Jesus is alive and well with God, and that is what uh, Muslims believe. So I do not believe that uh, Dr. Shiroshin using the Quran here has any proved anything against me, but in fact he has proved in support of me. And by the way, Dr. Shiroshin, the verse from Surah 2, 234, is not read yatawafuna, but it's read yutawafauna, because it is passive. The person is the one who is uh, taken by God. It's <laughs> uh, now, and as for the Arabic, in, uh, in the passage from Surah Maryam, where it says, Yawma uh, Amutu wa Yawma Oba'athu Hayya, both you and Sheikh Didat are correct about this. You're right that Jesus said this when he was uh, uh, in his uh, infancy or in his childhood, and naturally this refers to his future death and resurrection. But at the same time, that does not by, by this statement mean what you are trying to make it mean. It doesn't mean that Jesus already died and already resurrected. Because Muslims do believe that uh, even if Jesus died in the past, his resurrection would then be with uh, everyone in the Day of Judgment. And those who believe that he was raised alive and did not experience death, believe that when he comes back, he will die and he will be resurrected again. So the verse by itself does not prove what you wanted to prove and we're not being deceptive in, do, in saying that the verse refers to the future and we still can expect uh, that future so finally what about the sealed tomb and the guards at the tomb that's from Matthew and Matthew is renowned for his uh, additions like for example Matthew telling us that at the time of the death of Jesus the earth uh, shook the rock split the tombs were open and the, the resurrected bodies came out and appeared uh, to the people in the city. Well, this is remarkable, and hardly any historian believes that today, or even uh, conservative scholars of the gospel. And this has been pointed out uh, by Dr. William Lane Craig in the book, uh, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? Hardly anyone believes that this is true. But you can see that God, uh, Matthew has embellished the account, and if there were guards, the other gospels would know of it as well. But Mark's gospel does not allow for any guards, because when the women went to the tomb, they're wondering who will rule away the Stone for, the stone for them. They do not uh, expect that they will have to reckon with any guards. And if there were guards, as in Matthew's gospel, they should have known about that because they saw the tomb where it was laid. So finally, we should take it that uh, the evidence for the resurrection is entirely lacking and there is no reason for believing in the resurrection if we are not already Muslims. If we are Muslims, we believe that God raised Jesus. If we are called to leave Islam and to believe in Christianity, I don't think there is any way forward. Thank you. The next nine minutes, Dr. Shirosh, and hopefully the conclusion of for three minutes and question and answers. We present it to you tonight, first, the record of the Old Testament, second, the record of Christ's own predictions and the seven words on the cross, third, the record of the Synoptic Gospels, fourth, the record of John, the beloved disciple, the eyewitness, as the other disciples were there as well, the record of the book of Acts, which is after the resurrection, and then the record from secular history, and finally the appearance of the angels to the disciples and the appearance of Jesus to 500 and to Paul in glory.
What more do you want for evidence? How can I convince you tonight that a book written 600 years after the fact is to be believed instead of the eyewitnesses who saw and told the story? How would I believe if you and I were watching an accident on the highway and we're brought to court to testify and six years later the case is brought up again and they bring other witnesses who never were there, never on the street corner, never saw the accident, whose testimony will they accept? Why would I accept Quranic statements, hardly a handful of them, about my Jesus, which the entire New Testament details about it? Because without Jesus, there is New Testament. God loves you, and he has come to prove that. Now, I'd like to suggest that our dear brother will continue his labor, because I believe if he's an honest seeker, he's going to find Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, as I have found, because he loves you, and he died on the cross to save you from your sins. Amen. Now, here is my record for you. For you Muslim friends, this is the surah, the new surah on the crucifixion, and it is in Arabic and in English. Here goes. بسم الآب الكلمة الروح الإله الواحد الأوحد يا أهل الذين ظلوا من عبادنا لقد جاءكم الفرقان الحق يبين لكم كثيرا مما كنتم تجهلون من الإنجيل الحق ومما كنتم تكتمون. O you who have gone astray, yet still claim to be among our believing worshippers, the true Furqan has come to you to explain a considerable amount of knowledge which was unknown to you concerning the true gospel, along with what you have kept concealed in your souls. Sirajun munirun yukhrijun nasa minu dhulumati ila nur, fala taqulu ma ja'ana ban bashirin wa la nadhirin, faqad ja'akum bashirun wa nadhirun, wa lakinnakum tajhadun. It is a shining lamp that brings people out from darkness into the light. So do not complain that we have not sent you an evangelist and a prophet. An evangelist who is also a mighty prophet has been sent unto you. Alas, you are ungrateful. قَصُرَتْ أَفْهَمُكُمْ عَنْ إِدْرَاكِ الرُّوحَنِيَّاتِ فَاسْتَخَرْتُمْ الْأَرْضِيَّاتِ وَنَبَثْتُمْ السَّمَوِيَّاتُ جَهْلًا مِنْكُمْ فَعِشْتُمْ كَالْأَنْعَامِ يَصُوتُكُمْ نَهْمُ الْغَرَائِزِ وَفِرْتُرْتُ الْجَاهِلِينَ Theological issues seemed unfathomable to your limited understanding. Subsequently, you opted for the earthly issues and rejected the heavenly ones because of your own naivete. Consequently, you behave much like some creatures who are controlled by the urge of their basic instincts and not by reason or logic. وبلغنا سنتنا للناس كفة بلغا مبينا وارسلنا نورنا هدى للضالين ورحمتنا منارا للتائهين وسلامنا ملجأ للخائفين. We have incarnated our word into a perfect human being, Jesus the Messiah. Additionally, we have proclaimed our criteria to all of mankind as clear divine revelation. We have also sent him forth as our light to guide the lost, as our mercy for the suffering humanity, and as our peace to shelter the oppressed. إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ رُوحٌ وَحَقٌ وَمَحَبَّةٌ وَإِيمَانٌ وَسَلَامٌ فَبِالْرُوحِ وَالْحَقِّ فَالْيَقْنَةِ الْقَانِتُونَ وَبِالْمَحَبَّةِ وَالرَّحْمَةِ فَلَيْتَعَبَّدِ الْمُتَعَبِّدُونَ وَبِالْإِيمَانِ وَالسَّلَامِ فَلَيْتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ We are for surety spirit, truth, love, mercy, faith and peace. Therefore the committed must worship in spirit and in truth. The community of the believers must worship in love and compassion. The contenders must compete in faith and peace. فَلَا تُغَالُوا فِي الْكَفْرِ وَالدَّلَالِ إنما المسيح كلمة روحنا فأمنوا بنا وبكلمتنا وبروحنا فما نحن بثلاثة انتهوا خيرا لكم إنما نحن إله واحد فرد وتر ولا شريك لنا في العالمين As a result, you should never be proud of your unbelief and skepticism. The Messiah is in fact the word of our spirit. Thus trust in us, our word and our spirit. For we are not three separate entities. Cease from such deceptive pronouncements because it is more profitable for you. Essentially, we are the one and only true God who has no partner in the universe. وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يَصْلُبَ كَلِمَتَنَا وَأَنْ يَقْتُلَ رُوحَنَا وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَلَكِنْ قَصُرَتْ أَفْهَامُكُمْ عَنْ إِدْرَاكِ الْحَقِّ فَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ No human instrumentality has the power to crucify our word and kill our spirit. They did not crucify Jesus nor kill him as our spirit. Your comprehension lacks the understanding of this colossal truth. Therefore, you do not grasp it at all. وَشُبِّهَ لَكُمْ فَاخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ وَمَا لَكُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَى اتِّبَعَ الظُّنُونَ وَإِنْ إِنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَخْرُسُونَ He was made into your likeness. Thus your opinions differed concerning him. Because you have no testimony of an eyewitness concerning the event which took place on Calvary in Jerusalem six centuries before your document surfaced. All you know is hearsay ending in personal assumptions. إِنَّمَا صَلَبُوا عِيسَ الْمَسِيحَ بْنَ مَرْيَمْ جَسَدًا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا وَقَتَلُهُ يَقِينًا Assuredly, 
They did crucify Jesus the Messiah, the physical son of Mary, as a physical and real human being and killed him for certain as a substitute for sinful humanity. وما الأرواح إلا من لدننا وإلينا المعاد وما الأجساد إلا من الأرض وإليها مرجعها خلا جسد كلمتنا المسيح الذي صعد للسماء وسيعود وبه كان الفداء والخلاص للعالمين Human spirits are created by us and they eventually return to us as for the earthly bodies they are from dust and return to dust except the body of our word the Messiah who ascended into heaven and someday shall return for it is through him salvation and redemption are offered to the entire world laqad wahabnakum hayatan na'im fa takhayyartum 'adhab al-jahim wa ma zalamnakum walakin kuntum anfusakum tadlumun we have granted you through him a life of grace but you have opted for a life of disgrace oppress you we certainly have not you oppressed yourselves when you rejected our offer of salvation through the messiah وأحببنا العالمين فبذلنا كلمتنا الوحيدة هدى ورحمة للتأبين ونجينا المؤمنين من التهلكة وأسكناهم جنات النعيم because we love the world of humans so very much we sacrificed our one and only word to save them and show compassion upon anyone who would repent through Jesus we save anyone who believes in him from damnation in hell to eternal life in heaven where mansions of glory await them وما أرسلنا كلمتنا ليدين العالمين بليخلص الهالكين ويهبهم الحياة الأبدية ويقيهم عذاب الجحيم. We want to emphasize forcefully that our purpose for incarnating our word is not to condemn the lost, but to save them. Furthermore, we want to offer every repentant sinner life eternal through faith in Jesus and by our abundant grace. Thus, no one has to end up in the torments of hell unless he blatantly rejects this free gift of love through Messiah Jesus. This is one of the surahs in the new True for Khan, written by a friend of mine in Arabic. I had the privilege of translating into English. It's been printed four times already. It's another effort of trying to share with you the truth in love. Believe me, we love you as our beloved Muslim friends. And our hope is that through our prayer, through our lives, through our sacrifices, you'll understand that we are simply sharing with you what Jesus said. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth is the word of God, the Bible. The truth is Jesus himself who came to save you and me. Thank you and God bless you. Okay, um, a bit of a change in the program. We'll just go straight to the questions and hopefully we're going through the questions. Um, okay. Um, the first question is to Dr. Shorosh. Okay. You ready? <laughs> sure. um, can you please tell me, why, tell, me, tell me why you are not addressing Shabir Ali's points and instead you are, leading your pa you are, you are reading your papers prepared before the debate? I thought we were told not to clap or make noises or sounds and so forth. You're not listening very well. But be that as it may, you can just enjoy yourself. That's fine. My response is I ignore what he has presented because I don't believe in what he said. I simply overlook it and present the truth. For the battle is for the truth. We're not just having mental di discussions. We're not just having scholarly discussion. You know, he can present his case. I can present my case. But I'm presenting you the truth of the word of God. Now, if I believe in what he says, I would probably go on and do that. If I don't believe it, I just ignore it. And as far as I'm concerned, I appreciate his intelligence and his dedication and his hard work, but I just don't believe in what he's saying. So I present to you what I believe in what I'm saying. And you have the choice. It is not a matter of polemics and circular reasoning that he tries to use, and this scholar and that scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I love you, and I want to share with you the truth. That's my privilege. That's my honor. Thank you. I thought I made it kind of clear during the speakers are speaking, please no comments and clapping and things like that. All respect to the speakers, uh, we agree with them. 
<laughs> yeah, I agree with them or disagree with them. I think we should have show respect to both speakers. Thank you. Um, question, next question is Dr. Sh to Shabir. Um, from your discussion, it seems as if you are quite happy to use textual and historical criticism regarding the Bible. Would you recommend us any, bo any books on textual criticism on the Quran? Uh, yes, there have been several excellent books uh, written uh, by Muslims and by non-Muslims on the uh, textual study of the Quran. In Arabic, there is al uh, Khan fi Ulum al-Quran by Alama Suyuti. Uh, by, uh, there is also uh, uh, several others along the same line in, in the Arabic language. In the English language, we have uh, a few books done, one by Ahmad von Denver, which is a smaller book. Uh, a, a, a more recent book has been done by uh, Sheikh Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. And uh, there is one, an excellent one done by Mufti Taki Usmani from Pakistan that's translated into English. And uh, also there is uh, a book recently uh, produced by Muhammad Mustafa al-Azimi, The History of the Text of the Quran. Uh, I think this is the most uh, excellent of all of these uh, works and that's a good starting point for getting a good grasp of how the text of the Quran has been transmitted and preserved, both in memory and in writing over time, so that we can have the assurance that the uh, Quran we're reading today is the word of God that has been preserved as God has promised in his text in an ahna nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu la hafizun uh, we have uh, uh, revealed the uh, the message the reminder and we are surely going to uh, preserve it so we can see today that uh, the same kinds of uh, scholarly work that has been gone into the Bible has been gone into the Quran as well and uh, from the non-Muslim side there are some scholars who have worked on this for example there is a scholar Arthur Jeffrey who did uh, an excellent uh, uh, um, edition of the Kitab al-Masahif by the son of Abu Dawood, the famed uh, collector of one of the Sunan works. And uh, his introduction to that uh, is also worth uh, studying. However, many have found that uh, this uh, writing of Arthur Jeffrey uh, does not in fact uh, do justice to the history of the Quranic text as it was known. He has tried to compile from all of the uh, the Sira and the, and the Tafsir works, any mention that there has been a variant reading by someone else, and he has compiled all of those and given them equal weight. But I think uh, Muhammad Mustafa Azmi has uh, responded to some of the points that Arthur Jeffrey has made, but that book is also uh, worth uh, reading. Finally, we should say something about uh, using uh, the scholarship. When we look at what scholars have written, we do not look at uh, what they have said because they are scholars, because a scholar may be right, a scholar may be wrong, but we look at the evidence and proof based on which uh, they have formed their conclusions, and we examine that evidence and proof and see if we might form the same conclusion. We might uh, get a quick feel of the field by looking at what scholars have said, but that does not uh, settle the issue. In my presentation tonight, in dealing with the gospel material, you will recall that I uh, in, did not depend on the scholars, but I showed you specific examples where the story about Jesus has evolved over time and has been changed in order to make it look more assuredly that Jesus had died and more assuredly that Jesus had resurrected back to life. And when we see this kind of protest from within the Gospels, we realize that we should uh, treat it as that and have our own conclusions than the conclusions that the Gospels themselves are trying to portray to us. Thank you. Next question to Dr. Shorsh. If Jesus was the Son of God, would God sit back and allow the crucifixion of his Son without interfering? The entire purpose of Jesus Christ, as I shared with you this afternoon, if you were listening, was he was to be killed in our behalf, to lay his life as the greatest proof of God's love for us, and then rise again. In every gospel it stays there. Please remember that the scripture is written by eyewitnesses or people who talk with the eyewitnesses as for my good friend Shabir how in the world can he judge 2000 years after the fact what is a part of the Old Testament or New Testament or part of the Gospels or this that added or developed or all that how can he do that we removed by 2000 years and the record we have is accurate we'll be dealing tomorrow with the Bible and Jesus versus Muhammad and the Quran and I will share with you some more things concerning that but for the moment please remember 
that God did not interfere in the crucifixion because he had planned it from the foundation of the earth. The Bible tells us that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth. And in the first prophecy, he told us, as I read to you, that he, the son of the woman, not the man, the virgin birth, predicted at the beginning of creation that he would be the one who will crush the serpent's head, conquering death with death, although the serpent will only bruise his heel. So his death was a bruise, and that's why he rose. The resurrection of Christ is not only proven by the scripture, by history, but by changed lives of murderers, of thieves, of alcoholics, of abusers who are transformed by the power of Jesus so the life of Christ through the Holy Spirit can live in them and they can shine for the Lord. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control that you cannot come up with without the Spirit of God working in your life. And I'm grateful to say that Jesus fulfilled the will of God that's why the last thing he said on the cross was, it is finished, it's completed. The plan of God for the salvation of humanity is totally completed. And then he said, into thy hands I give what? My spirit. Because he is also spirit. Jesus is both. Perfect man, perfect God. Thank you. Thank you. Next question to Brother Shapiro. It says, please explain... Please explain what the Quran means by Allah raising Jesus to himself. Because if Allah raised him in the physical form, then who was buried in the grave? And if Allah raised Jesus, Jesus' spirit to himself, then how, then how could he stay alive without his spirit? Of course, if Allah raised him in a physical form, then uh, the question doesn't hold. The question is asking how could he stay alive without the spirit. Of course, if Allah raised him in a spiritual form, then he is alive as a spirit. Uh, but uh, I think your question more uh, to the point is probably, if Allah raised him as a spirit, what happened to his body? But that assumes that the tomb was empty and the reports about it are accurate. But in fact, scholars who have worked back on this, uh, they have reasonable assurance that in fact the t story about the empty tomb is a later development. The first proclamation about Jesus being alive was about a spiritual proclamation, as we find in, in Paul's writing. Uh, Paul believed in a spiritual resurrection. But later on, people want to flesh this out, because if you just preach a spiritual resurrection, then people may not believe you. How do you mean that he was resurrected as a spirit? Uh, so you want to prove that he really resurrected as flesh and blood, so then the tomb has to be empty. And so the story develops over time. And this has been admitted by Raymond Brown in his massive two-volume commentary, part of the Anchor Bible series, or the commentary on the Gospel according to John. Now, uh, Dr. Shirosh is asking us, how can we know that this is the, the case? How can we know that things like this uh, happened, that the Gospels developed over time and so on? Well, by a simple comparison. Scholars study and they look at uh, the similarity of wording, they look at uh, what has been borrowed from what has been copied. It's like a professor receiving two assignments uh, from two different students and seeing that there is a verbal uh, resemblance between the two. Uh, naturally, some degree of copying will be suspected. And if that uh, verbal correspondence continues throughout the page, well, then we know for sure that this has been the case. And then when we see that uh, there have been not only verbal correspondences which uh, show undeniably that copying has taken place, we see also changes where we know also that there are deliberate reasons for, for changing. And we try to find out what each author was trying to do. This is an entire field of study that has taken hundreds of years and have developed to a certain level of confidence now, we can be quite sure now that Matthew and Luke were reworking from, God, John's, from uh, Mark's gospel and they have changed the story. Matthew has invented things such as the story about the, uh, the, the saints coming back to life. And what Matthew has done here is quite curious because he says that when Jesus died, the saints came back to life. And then he says, after the resurrection, they came out of the tombs and appeared to the people in the city. So Matthew has it there that they came back to life and were remaining in their tombs for the next day and a half. Now why did Matthew do it this way? Why didn't they just come out immediately? Because Matthew wants them that Jesus should be the first to resurrect, meaning to come out of the tomb. Let the saints come out afterwards. But Matthew also wants for the saints to come back to life at the cosmic moment when Jesus actually dies. So he has it both ways. They come back to life when Jesus dies, 
But they don't come out of their graves until after Jesus. So Matthew has his cake and also eats it. But if all of these dead saints came and walked around in the city of Jerusalem, that would be big news. And it will be in all of the Gospels. But nobody else seems to have known about this. And scholars agree now that this is an invention from Matthew. Thank you. Um, the next question, Dr. Shiro says, you, you quoted John 19 to prove he was an eyewitness and wrote the gospel according to John. Please explain, therefore, the following pronouns. John 19.35, it says, And he that saw it bear, uh, it bear record, and his record is true, and he knows that he saith true, that you might believe. And in John 21.24, Who are we? In verse commas, who say that know that his testimony is true? First of all, my challenging Shabir, the Quran says Jesus raised the dead, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if Jesus raised the dead, why do you doubt the rising of the other dead? I'd like to know. Thank you. Okay. The other interesting thing is as to scholarship, let's talk about scholarship. Ladies and gentlemen, I am yet to see a Bible he can bring to me or anybody can bring to me that shows me that the Bible we have in our hand, hand has been developed and changed from the Bibles that we have throughout history. We have 25,000 copies in museums all over the world. And why would we change all of that? From the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, these were eyewitnesses. Matthew wrote from the view that Jesus is from the line of David, so he presented him to the Jews as the king. And so he relates all of that. Mark presented the gospel to the Romans. Soldiers, fast, going, moving. That's why it is so short. That's why it is immediately, immediately, immediately. Luke presented the gospel as a compassionate person who Jesus was and gives you more details about the miracles because he was a doctor and gave you the details how those miracles take place. Well, I challenge my friend to show me anywhere in the Quran where he ever shows us, where the Quran ever shows us how Jesus raised the dead, how Jesus gave the sight to the blind, although it says he did this, he did that. My suggestion is, you look back to the true record. The Quran is borrowed from the Bible, plagiarized from the Bible, and I challenge you to find the truth, not a copy, not an interpretation of Muhammad of the Old and New Testament. Find the scripture and rejoice in the truth that God really came in the person of Jesus to say, I love you, I want to save you, I want to change your life, I want to bless your life, I want to give you eternal life, and my purpose is to bless you and make you a blessing. Now, as for the question about the record of John, it's very simple. Here it is. One of the methods of writing, and I do that, I've written 10 books, is to use a third person. Secondly, it's humility. Thirdly, when you read in the book, he calls himself the beloved disciple. He is so humble about the way God has worked in his life, he trying to shy away as if to promote himself. This is why he says at the end, the one who saw this, he is giving his personal testimony, writing this for you, for me, because through this, you can believe. An eyewitness, not a second report, not 600 years later after the fact, but an eyewitness of all that happened and all that Jesus did and said. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. Next question Dr. Sh uh, to Brother Shabir. It says, Jesus prophesies in the Quran, Blessed is the day I die and raise again. Is Shabir trying to, to, to defunct this verse of the Quran and how? And how, he can stay, how, can, how can he stay a Muslim by trying to do so? Moreover, are you in a disagreement with those Islamic scholars who believe that Jesus died for a few hours and then was raised to Allah? Well, first of all, I accept the verse of the Quran, every verse of the Quran. And uh, I've explained that this verse of the Quran does not prove that Jesus actually died in the past. Uh, when Jesus said this, he was alive, and he said that at some future point he will die and he will be resurrected to life. So whether that future point already occurred in our history or will occur in our future, that uh, is something that Muslim scholars can still discuss and even differ about. The idea that Jesus died for several hours and then uh, uh, God uh, took him up uh, alive 
uh, that was reported by Wahab bin Munabba. It is an opinion that was given as an explanation of a Quranic verse. It is not a binding opinion on all Muslims. In fact, there are several opinions from several different scholars. You cannot believe in all of them, but you weigh them, you sift them, you try to see which are the best opinions, and then you hold those. And Muslims can have different opinions about things which are not essential to our belief. And what it precisely happened with Jesus in the end is not an essential item in our belief. It is essential to believe in every verse in the Quran, uh, but it is not essential to believe in every interpretation of every verse of the Quran. Now, as to uh, Dr. Shirosh's question, why would I believe in, uh, that God can resurrect someone and not believe in Matthew's depiction of that resurrection? Well, the fact that God resurrects people does not mean that God resurrected every person who has ever been claimed to have been resurrected from the dead in the past. So, if, yes, we believe it, that God resurrects uh, people from the dead, but uh, hardly anyone today believes uh, in, in what Matthew has written here. This is oh, Matthew's own apology. Uh, and uh, Christian biblical scholars, as I've mentioned, Dr. William Lane Craig, if you think he's not a good scholar, tell us so. Uh, he has said that hardly any um, scholar of the Gospels would believe Matthew's uh, story today. Uh, they think this is Matthew's invention. Is the Quran copied from the Bible? No. I have said previously, and Dr. Shirosh uh, uh, has not responded to what I've asked for. Show me us an example where the Quran is actually, as he says, plagiarized the Bible. What I will show you, in fact, uh, is that the Quran improves upon the Bible. For example, you have uh, the story of uh, Mary uh, and the Annunciation to Mary. What does the Gospel of Luke say? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power, the power of, the, uh, of God will, will come upon you. The power of the Mighty One will come upon you and the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and so what will be born in you will be called Son of the Holy Spirit. Well, this makes it appear that the Holy Spirit or God is taking the place of the husband for Mary. But the Quran puts it nicely. Uh, when Mary asks, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? The Quran says, uh, that is easy for God. Whenever he decrees a thing, he only says to it be, and it becomes. So it, it is quite uh, a different narrative in, in the Quran. You can see that the sexual imagery has been greatly reduced, and the Quran then proves itself more to be a worthy book to guarantee the development of uh, human spirituality. So finally, I think the the question boils down to, should we believe in the Quranic narrative even though it comes uh, 600 years later? I think so. The Quran is uh, a book that brings the same spiritual message of Jesus, but in a form that guarantees uh, a, a better spiritual development. And I thank you very much. Okay, this is the last set of questions for each guest. It says here, why would Jesus, if he is, he, he is of, of the same essence, nature of God, i.e. the Son of God, cry out to God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is the sin of God so weak? Why is, why is he complaining about his fate and his God? Thank you. Tomorrow I'll be sharing with you about your challenge, and how much the of the Bible has been borrowed in the Quran, and I think you'll be excited. I will be, <laughs> yes. Be Nevertheless, we are looking at a mystery. Jesus was a complete man, complete God. At one time, because of the fact that a little bit of what he is and what he was in the garden, you shared that with us last night, the whole crowd coming to arrest him fell backward. Another time on the mountain, the disciples fell on their faces. He was clothed in human flesh. On the cross, he cried out because, number one, he was fulfilling a prophecy that I read to you from, chapter, from Psalms 22, the hymn book of the Jews. My God, my God, what have you forsaken me? The rest of that psalm I read to you this afternoon, if you were listening, was an explanation of the suffering of Jesus for you and for me. So he was fulfilling that. Third, the word of God explains enough for us to see a glimpse of the justice of God on the cross because without shedding of blood there is no remission of sin Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us so on the cross you see the justice of God in that Jesus was our redeemer our substitute he took your place he took my place if you owed a million dollars a million pounds and you don't have it a French friend rich friend comes and pays your debt you're free the debt that you and I owe is death 
That's why Jesus, the second Adam, the perfect Adam, the first Adam fought in the garden and lost, the second Adam fought in the garden of Gethsemane and won, and he took your place. That's why the scripture, the, 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 the Quran says, Shubbi halahum. He looked like them. He took their place. He took their shape. He took their sin. He took their burden. That's why on the cross, as a result, God Almighty, who cannot look at sin, turned his face, so to speak. A mystery that one day we can understand in glory. But the fact is Jesus felt a momentary separation between him and the Father. That's why he cried out, Father, forgive them. He was interceding for you, interceding for me. He was not a weakling. He calmed the waves. He walked on the water. Here is the dead. He gave sight to the blind. You can't call a person weakling, can you? Muhammad never performed a miracle. But Jesus performed 40. Thank you. The final question tonight goes to Dr. Shabir. Um, if God forgives us easily without redemption, Sorry? if God forgives us easily without redemption, so his mercy is contradicting, contradiction to his justice, explain. No, Muslims do not see a, a contradiction between the mercy and the justice of God. If God punishes people, then he is just for, in the punishment that he gives. But if he wants to forgive, he can forgive because there's no authority over him insisting that he must punish the people who sin. So we see this in the teachings of uh, Jesus, for example, in the Gospel according to Luke, in the story of the prodigal son. What did Jesus teach by that? Jesus taught that if you turn back, God will forgive you just like the father forgave his son. Uh, and, and there is, in that case, no need for anyone to pay for your sins. If somebody stands in your place, that means you go free. If Jesus stood in our place, it means we should all go free. If God turns around and penalizes us as well because we are sinful or because we do not repent, that means he will claim the price of the sin twice. That will be unjust. So I do not believe here that Dr. Shirosh has given us a solution to the sin problem. Now, Dr. Shirosh uh, has asked us, you know, how do we know that the Bible has been corrupted? There's so many 2,500 manuscripts, or uh, actually 5,300 of the New Testament. Dr. Shirosh, can I borrow you a copy of the Bible here? Do you, do you mind if I just... You have your own. Can I just have a look at yours? Don't you have one? I just need yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Six on me. You have the authentic <laughs> Bible, Dr. Shirosh. <laughs> now, the Hebrew and the Greek. this is the New King James Version of the Bible. It contains 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. You're aware of that. You bring that story again. You're aware of that. Okay. And you're aware that you have already said in the previous debate that that is a later insertion into the Bible. Why are you carrying a Bible that has a verse that is a forgery? One verse out of tens of thousands. But you admit at least one verse that is a forgery. It's not a forgery. And there are Bibles which do not contain that verse. I have them. He could carry those. But he carries the Bible which has the verse which says that there are three in heaven and these three are one because it's a beloved verse. It's hard to part with it. You carry that verse and yet you ask us where is there a forgery in the Bible? There it is, Dr. Shirosh. It, it is right there. Tomorrow. <laughs> we will see. Now, Dr. Shirosh uh, wants to prove that the Quran has been borrowed from previous uh, uh, material. And of course, Muslims will have to have the patience tomorrow to sit and listen to him. But you can have the assurance that I will be prepared to deal with uh, his claims. And in fact, uh, he should be prepared to listen to my response uh, as well. Um, we have shown so far, folks, that uh, it is the Christian obligation to prove that uh, Jesus died. And Dr. Shirosh has not actually given us any proof outside of the Bible, anything that reasonable people can believe in. And uh, it is uh, the obligation also to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. And he has not actually proven that uh, as a historical fact. Dr. Shirosh's references to Old Testament prophecies about Jesus should be understood uh, in the light of what Randall Helms has written in his book entitled Gospel Fictions. The new gospel material was written in order to justify the prophecies, to say that Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies. They didn't write it the way it occurred in history. They wrote it the way they read it in the prophecy. So they read the prophecy into the life of Jesus and then wrote that as history after the fact because they wanted to match the prophecy. So you cannot then turn the logic around and say that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. You, you have to understand that the material was written in such a way to forge it so that you prove that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy by the very writing. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, there we conclude. And, uh, just